It all began when I decided to take a break from the city. The hustle and bustle had started taking a toll on my mental health, and I figured I needed some peace and quiet to reconnect with myself. So, I rented a small, rustic cabin in a secluded part of the Redwood National Park in California. I'm Randall Pritchett, a freelance graphic designer who has always preferred nature's company to that of people. I arrived at the cabin in the early afternoon, smiling at the thought that no one would interrupt my solitude. Setting down my bags, I inspected the place. It was cozy, made of old logs with moss creeping up the sides. Inside, there were basic furnishings and a small fireplace. Perfect for my needs. The first few days went by uneventfully, just hiking through the woods and enjoying quiet evenings by the fire. One day while out hiking, I stumbled upon what appeared to be an animal trap with something caught within it. I inspected it closely but saw no signs of an animal, only torn clothing and dried blood. Frowning, I returned to the cabin that evening, wondering what kind of person would leave traps like that scattered around this isolated place. As night fell and darkness enveloped the surroundings, I heard branches snapping and leaves rustling outside my window. Telling myself it was just some nocturnal animal, I resumed reading P. G. Wodehouse's classic novel, injecting laughter into my lonesome evening. But the sounds persisted, growing louder over time. Suddenly feeling uneasy by the seemingly mocking presence lurking just outside caused me to pace around nervously. My solitude no longer felt comforting. Instead, it felt like a shroud that could ensnare me any time. I couldn't take it anymore. Undoubtedly spooked by my thoughts running wild, I stepped outside with a flashlight and rifle acquired at a second-hand store before leaving town. As I pointed the beam out into the darkness, I was met with nothing but empty woods, their silence unnerving me more than ever. Shaking it off, I reassured myself that every little sound was just nature playing tricks on my overactive imagination. Grinning wryly at my baseless fears, I returned inside to retire for the night. The next morning, while eating breakfast on the cabin porch, I noticed footprints leading out to the forest, human footprints that weren't mine. Feeling a surge of adrenaline, I knew something was amiss. Immediately grabbing my hunting rifle, I followed the tracks deep into the woods. The deeper I went, the trail seemed to grow colder until it reached an abandoned campsite with its own grisly tail, disheveled tents and scattered personal belongings as if hastily abandoned in fear. In one corner lay what appeared to be a torn-apart human body raw dread creeping through my core at this gruesome scene. As I carefully approached, Examining the remains from a safe distance, my heart almost stopped when a large creature emerged from behind a tree. Towering over me with rippling muscles and twisted limbs draped in ragged a torn skin and matted hair, this thing seemed anything but human. In pure terror and on instinct, I fired off several shots as it lunged towards me its guttural growl filling up my whole being. Despite multiple bullets tearing away parts of its grotesque form, this monstrous beast continued its pursuit unhindered. Panic set in, and I sprinted away from the monstrous creature, my rifle clutched in my trembling hands. Desperation urged me to find a hiding spot before it could get close enough to catch me. By sheer luck, I stumbled upon a small cave and squeezed myself into its dark depths as quickly and quietly as possible. I sat there, listening intently for any sound that might indicate the creature's whereabouts. Time stretched on, every second feeling like an eternity. My fingers tightened around my rifle, ready to fight if I had no other choice. However, I didn't dare challenge the monster directly knowing that doing so would likely end in my doom. As I hid in the cave, 
It dawned on me that I had no idea how long it would take for help to arrive or if help even existed in this remote place. Cell service was non-existent, and the rugged terrain made communicating or escaping nearly impossible. If anyone came searching for me due to my unexpected absence while hunting, they might not find me for days or even weeks. Eventually, after hours of suppressive silence, I mustered the courage to emerge from the cave. Inch by inch, I carefully made my way back towards the abandoned campsite and the gruesome scene that waited there. When I finally reached it, a ghastly recovery awaited me. More bodies were strewn about, victims of whatever beast hunted this land. Fearfully acknowledging that there was now more than one creature roaming nearby only amplified my already unbearable terror. Thankful for my rifle at hand but still reluctant to face another attack head-on, desperation drove me onward down the path toward my cabin. It seemed that with every step taken though, my anxiety and fear intensified. It became clear leaving this forest and getting somewhere safe was of utmost priority. After what felt like an endless trek through nightmarish terrain where danger loomed everywhere— I finally managed to make my way back to the cabin. The sight of the small wooden structure brought some small measure of comfort, and I felt a tiny glimmer of hope rise within me. However, before I could cross the threshold, another horrifying realization struck me. There were now more footprints circling the cabin. These creatures were all around me hunting me like prey. My heart raced and I scrambled inside my safe haven, feverishly barricading the doors and windows. Now trapped between evasion or death alone in my isolated cabin, I began to recall a conversation with an old hunter claiming that creatures roamed these woods that were beyond rational explanation. At the time, thinking his ideas outlandish and nonsensical, I brushed them off, as merely folklore only now did it cross my mind that perhaps they were solid warnings regarding this terrible truth. In those moments of fear and chaos, amidst a maelstrom of gore and terror, one thought became increasingly clear, confronting whatever lurked outside head-on was futile survival depended on escape. The stalled agony seemed to stretch on for days— as foraging for food became increasingly perilous amongst prowling predators. All the while covering ground in desperate search for help or a means out of this cursed woodland hell was slow going through treacherous terrain. As fate would have it, though, a chance encounter with another group of hunters finally granted an avenue to salvation. Recognizing their friendly faces filled me with overwhelming relief as they offered support as we collectively sought escape from this dreadful forest abyss. My name is Jebby Dias Vedberg, and I had spent my weekend at a cabin in the woods near Forks, Washington. I had needed an escape from the city after a painful breakup. I lit the fireplace and sat on the couch, feeling at peace. Suddenly, there was a faint sound of someone knocking on the door. Creaking it open, I found no one outside but heard desperate cries for help in the distance. Intrigued and worried, I grabbed my flashlight and ventured into the woods. Following the cries, I stumbled upon Malcolm Hutchins, a neighbor staying at another cabin nearby. He was in terrible condition, bloodied and scratched as if attacked by a wild animal. Gasping for breath, he told me about his friend Jania Childress who went missing while they were hiking in these woods. Despite wanting to call for help, Malcolm explained that their phones had no signal due to being in a remote location. We decided to search together for Jania near where Malcolm last saw her. Hours passed with no sign of her. As we trudged through dense foliage, we discovered tracks unlike any animal we'd ever seen, large, clawed prints with a shuffling trail between them. 
Following these eerie marks led us to the remains of Jania's clothes, torn and soaked in crimson. A guttural growl echoed through the trees as we approached a small clearing where Jania's lifeless body lay mangled and disfigured beyond recognition. Moments later, an enormous figure emerged from behind her remains. The creature towered over nine feet tall with sharp quills protruding from its hunchback form. It had long arms ending in vicious claws and walked on massive legs. Its elongated head bore two slits for nostrils and a gaping mouth full of razor-like teeth. Seeing this monster sent waves of dread through us both, while we trembled before it. We were paralyzed with fear. The giant creature seemed to be counting its blessings when it noticed us. Its eyes flashed a primal hunger. We couldn't summon any words, focusing on surviving instead. I whispered to Malcolm that our best bet was to split up, hoping the beast would follow one of them, allowing the other to flee and get help. Nodding grimly, Malcolm ran to the right while I sprinted in the opposite direction. I could hear the beast's powerful footsteps pursuing me, each strike shaking the very earth beneath me. My heart raced fully aware that the end might be near. Light was fading fast as evening fell, and I struggled to keep my footing amidst roots and rocks. Nearing exhaustion, I came across a river bank and plunged headfirst into the cold rapids, hoping water would throw off its pursuit. The crashing waves drowned out all noise as I fought against the current. Spent from drenching myself in icy water, I clawed my way onto the bank downstream. My senses sharpened as I listened QBR-9 intently for any sounds of pursuit. To my relief, there were none. In near darkness now, I stumbled on through the woods trying to reorient myself. My mind raced with thoughts of everything that had happened, Jania murdered by this monstrous creature, Malcolm's unknown fate, and my own harrowing escape thus far. Stumbling upon a disused logging road provided momentary relief since it led back towards civilization, but heading down the road made me an easy target for a creature possibly still stalking me from behind. Each rustle and snap in the underbrush set my nerves on edge, constantly questioning if that last noise was stealthy footsteps creeping behind me or just whined through fallen leaves. Determined not to become another casualty like Jania, I kept pressing down the road mustering all of my remaining strength. Suddenly, I realized that I was not alone, and Malcolm was beside me. Relief quickly turned to horror as his arm was missing and blood gushed from the wound. Malcolm clutched his bleeding arm, trying to speak between ragged breaths. We have to find help, he gasped agony etched across his face. As much as I wanted to call for help, I couldn't risk drawing attention to our whereabouts. The creature could still be nearby, ready to strike at any sound. We have to keep moving, Malcolm. We'll find a better spot and call for help then. With renewed purpose, we pressed forward down the logging road despite exhaustion and the constant fear gnawing at us. Several miles down the road, a small cabin emerged from the darkness. With nowhere else to go and desperate for assistance, we decided to approach it cautiously. Maybe someone in there knows something about this place or saw that thing. It's worth a shot, Malcolm whispered through clenched teeth, his voice heavy with anguish. The door was unlocked. As we stumbled inside, the pungent aroma of rot and decay assaulted us a chilling reminder of Jania's fate that sent shivers down my spine. An elderly man sat motionless in a worn rocking chair, his lifeless eyes staring blankly into nothingness. Malcolm's face turned pale as he examined the body. Deep gashes riddled with dark tendrils of infection oozed a vile liquid. My blood ran cold as I realized this was the work of the same creature that pursued us. I grabbed Malcolm's good arm and pulled him back outside, our hearts racing as we scanned the area for any signs of danger. 
The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. This creature wasn't just hunting us. It was hunting everything in its path. It was at that moment that I heard the distant sound of an approaching vehicle rumbling down the logging road. Grabbing Malcolm, we hurried towards the sound and soon spotted an old pickup truck coming in our direction. Desperation and hope coursed through me as I flagged down its headlights. The truck pulled to a halt, and a burly man with a concerned expression emerged. As he took in the sight of Malcolm's injury and our disheveled appearance, he demanded an explanation. We were attacked by something, I said, trying to keep the tremor from my voice. Our friend is dead, and this is beyond our capacity to handle. The man assessed us for a moment before sighing and nodding in agreement. He introduced himself as Hank, a local hunter familiar with the area. As we drove away from the cabin, Hank listened carefully as Malcolm and I recounted the events that had led to our current predicament. When we finished, Hank's eyes darkened with recognition. He explained that an unknown creature had been stalking these woods for years, its relentless bloodlust leaving a trail of mangled corpses behind. According to him, nobody knew what or why it hunted, but those who crossed paths with the beasts rarely lived to tell their tale. Hank dropped us off at the nearest hospital where Malcolm received treatment for his gory wound. As nurses tended to him, I reflected on our harrowing ordeal and thanked whatever forces had kept us alive. After Malcolm was discharged from the hospital, we returned home, accompanied by nightmares of our chilling experience. We never fully uncovered the brutal truth behind our assailant's vicious attacks but will forever be haunted by its grisly fate. Ultimately, Jania became another tragic victim of this enigmatic predator, one among many forever lost in those desolate woods. Life would never be the same. We may not have fought back against this fearsome creature or sought answers about its origin, but we survived. Though Malcolm is left bearing permanent scars from his encounter with that abomination lurking in those dark woods, he adapts, just as any other survivor would. As one of the fortunate few who lived to tell our tale, we vowed to treasure every day and remain ever vigilant, the memory of what hunted us never too far from our thoughts. And to those who would venture into the treacherous wilds beyond civilization's comforting embrace, Beware. I stumbled upon the rustic cabin deep in the Algonquin forest after a long hike, needing a break from the monotony of city life. My name is Bartley Plumridge, and I'm an overworked accountant that needed some peace and quiet. The sun was setting as I settled in and prepared a modest meal. After eating, I took a walk around the area to familiarize myself with my surroundings. I found an old trail nearby, which piqued my curiosity. As I followed the path, I noticed a horrible stench wafting through the trees. That's when I saw it a grotesque sight that seared itself into my memory. An adult male hung from a tree branch by his knees, his face bloated and purple, clearly deceased. Panicking, I raced back to the cabin and grabbed my cell phone, trying to call for help. No signal. Why now? I muttered under my breath. Overwhelmed by the horrid scene, with no way of reaching anyone, I nonchalantly mentioned this unfortunate ordeal to one other camper named Hermina Salzberg whom I had met a couple of hours ago. Hermina returned with me to the scene where we stumbled upon two more bodies gruesomely disfigured in a similar manner. Determined to share our findings with officials, we bundled up for the night anticipating our imminent journey back to civilization. In our pursuit to leave as early as possible, we started through dense woods in dim light when Hermina let out an ear-piercing scream. She pointed at bizarre claw marks on a nearby tree trunk something enormous had come through recently. 
We were cautious moving forward, knowing that whatever left those tracks lurked somewhere close by. After hours of hiking in silence, our nerves frayed at every snapping twig and rustling leaf. Turning a bend brought us face to face with something beyond comprehension. The creature stood at least eight feet tall, a sickly mix of bone and sinew, covered in patches of matted fur. Its eyes were bulbous and black, its mouth a gaping maw filled with razor-sharp teeth that curved unnaturally toward its mangled face. Before we could react, the creature lunged at Hermina, ferociously tearing into her flesh with those terrible teeth. I scrambled for a loose branch, swinging it and connecting with the monster's grotesque skull. It momentarily released Hermina, enough for me to grab her arm and pull her away from its grasp. Escaping from the scene was the only option now. Despite her injuries, we sprinted through the trees and brambles while frantically looking for any sign of safety. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I replayed memories of loved ones in my head my wife Regina Plumridge, and my two children Lawrence Plumridge and Marion Plumridge. In the chaos, we found an old cabin in the woods our best chance to hide out at this point. As we barricaded ourselves inside, listening for any sounds outside, I noticed a rusted hunting rifle mounted on the wall. We prepared for it to find us wounds bandaged as best we could and weapon ready. Moments passed like painful eternities until we heard those heavy footfalls making their way closer to our hiding spot. As the door rattled under the pressure of the creature's pounding fists, the weight of that fateful day in Algonquin forest set in. Wooden planks creaking under its immense force, each thud pushing us further into an unending nightmare. With Hermina's life on the line, I didn't have time to ponder about the creature that had attacked us. Grasping the hunting rifle, I prayed it still worked as we waited for the horrendous being to make its move. The creature's nails scraped against the window outside, creating a chilling noise that reminded me of nails against the chalkboard. It was almost as if it could smell our fear. Hermina and I tried to remain quiet, so as not to reveal our location. We didn't call for help, fearing that any noise would alert the creature to our exact hiding spot. The cabin door finally caved in under the force of the creature's relentless pounding. Its appearance was even more horrifying up close, with gruesome claws and filthy skin covered in patchy hair. The creature let out a guttural growl that reverberated throughout the room. Trembling with fear, I raised the rifle and fired a shot directly at the monster. To my relief and surprise, it staggered back. Seizing this opportunity, we fled from the cabin into the dark woods. As we desperately struggled through the underbrush, thoughts raced through my mind. Who could we seek help from? What was this thing that hunted us? The confusion only added to our terror as we continued running without looking back. Running for our lives, we stumbled upon a small village nestled within these woods. The townspeople looked wary but sympathetic towards our obvious distress. A family took us in for the night so we could rest before trying to find help. During breakfast with them the next morning, they cautiously asked us what happened in hushed voices, worried about scaring their children who were listening eagerly nearby. Describing our ordeal, from the razor-sharp teeth and unnatural form of the antagonist, left their terrified faces etched in my mind forever. It sounds like you encountered something unheard of, one of the villagers said. You're both lucky to be alive. With this chilling thought, we decided not to call for help immediately. There was the fear of bringing in curious officials who would only put themselves and others in danger by attracting that creature's attention. We knew we couldn't remain in hiding forever so we set out on our own to find assistance from someone with experience in dealing with the unknown. We traversed the woods for days, keeping a vigilant watch in case the malicious creature tracked us down. 
Our journey led us to an old hunter named Gerald who had lived on the outskirts of the forest for years. He listened patiently as we recounted our encounter with the creature. Gerald took one look at Hermina's still healing wounds and nodded solemnly. I've never come across such a thing myself, he admitted. But I've heard stories from other hunters encountering similar creatures deep within these woods. With little choice, we realized Gerald was our best chance of finding answers, or at least some protection from this sinister beast. Reluctantly, he agreed to guide us back through the forest and help locate any signs of the creature. As we trekked in silence, an overwhelming fear loomed over us, creating a sense of dread that clung heavier than the damp air. Suddenly, there it was again, that guttural growl that sent shivers down our spines and made our heart rates soar. The creature lunged at Gerald with brutal force. I fired a shot, yet it seemingly didn't have the same effect as before. Although weakened by my bullets, it managed to take a swipe at Gerald's leg before retreating into the darkness. We carried Gerald towards safety as he grimaced in pain from his injury. Thankfully, we didn't encounter the monster again even though its presence haunted us until we reached civilization. Hermina and I settled down in the village we initially sought refuge in. We found solace in the fact that despite losing everything, including our dear friend Gerald who succumbed to his injuries, we survived. The chilling memories of that creature never truly left us, serving as a gruesome reminder of how fragile life can be. While we were never able to truly identify the creature that hunted us in those woods, Gerald's stories left us with a shiver-inducing theory. Maybe, just maybe, it wasn't one singular entity but rather a steadily growing breed of unknown predators lurking within the forest's depths waiting for their next unfortunate victim. My name is Balthazar Crane, and I'm not one to believe in spooky stories. Never been the kind of guy that bought into accounts of strange creatures roaming the woods. But ever since my recent stay at Whispering Pines... A small cabin nestled deep within the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, I can't deny what I've seen with my own eyes. To escape the city's chaos, my childhood friend Agamemnon Finch and I decided to spend some time at the cabin that his peculiar uncle possessed. It was all laughter and reminiscing when we reached the clearing after a long winding drive through the dense forest. The cabin was simple a single living space with two cots, a small kitchen in one corner, and a worn-out rug in front of a stone fireplace. We settled quickly as if we never left our youthful adventures behind. It felt calm, inviting. Our first night was uneventful. However, on the second day, we stumbled upon something horrifying while hiking. Deep in the woods, we discovered what seemed like an abandoned campsite, blood-spattered tents, smashed jars of food, ripped clothes, and disturbingly signs of struggle on the nearby rocks. Shaken by this ghastly discovery, Agamemnon quipped a joke with trembling voice to lighten up our mood, but his attempt failed to wash away our growing unease. As we headed towards Whispering Pines following our trail back, I could feel someone or something watching us from beyond the tall pines that surrounded us silent observers anticipating their next move. That evening, as darkness fell, I sensed movement deep within the pitch-black forest, subtle rustling just beyond my line of sight. Agamemnon chuckled nervously at my uneasiness and suggested an idea just as unnerving as that feeling. What if whoever attacked those campers is still out here? During that night, it happened our first unnerving encounter with the beast beyond imagination. An inhuman growl tore through the frigid mountain air, shaking us to our core. The sound snatched away whatever ounce of bravery we had left. Mustering our courage, 
Barely enough to continue breathing, we grabbed flashlights to peer outside. What we saw next is etched into my memory too haunting and repulsive to forget. A horrendous creature emerged from the shadows of the towering pines. Enormous, covered with thick matted fur and long twisted claws, it towered over us with bared teeth dripping in anticipation. Instantly fear entangled common sense. There was no time to call for help in this secluded forest. Heart pounding frantically in my chest, I fumbled for my gun. Trembling fingers pulled the trigger as we aimed at the monster once, twice, three times. Reloading quickly, Agamemnon fired too until every shot was spent, panic driving defense against instinctual survival. Did we even hit it? The chilling truth grasped us it stood there still, unfazed by gunshots, bloodthirsty eyes never leaving our petrified faces. The creature lunged suddenly, pouncing at unimaginable speed towards the cabin door. Our world flipped inside out as its massive claws dug into the rickety wooden frame like a knife through butter. The door appeared flimsy under such brute force. No match for this nightmarish beast honing its killer instinct on uncanny prey. Agamemnon and I retreated further into the cabin, pressing our backs against the far wall. The monster's seething gaze pierced through the splintered doorway, saliva dripping onto wood. We knew the door wouldn't hold. It was a feeble barrier against this gargantuan predator. As it tore through the door, we scrambled to find a hiding spot. The cellar. A hatch on the cabin floor led to a small, dusty space. We rushed down, closing the hatch and holding our breaths. Not daring to make even the slightest sound, we whispered about our next move. We should try calling for help. Agamemnon proposed, attempting to dial 911 on his phone. The lack of signal in this dense forest was suffocating. Even in our most desperate hour, isolation was inescapable. Let's wait until it leaves, I suggested. Gaining some distance from that monstrous thing seemed like our only chance. As time crawled by like an injured insect, we started discussing possible escape plans. There had to be something we hadn't thought of yet. Agamemnon scanned the walls of the dim cellar and found a window narrow enough that it would open with minimal noise but large enough for us to climb through. The creature was prowling above us now, its heavy footsteps echoing through the cabin floorboards. There was nothing left but a relentless pursuit, its wild instincts against our ingenuity. Climbing up to unlock the window, Agamemnon suddenly cried out as one of those long twisted claws pierced through the ceiling and grabbed his shoulder with excruciating force. I could hear bones crunching as Red seat down Agamemnon's arm. Through sheer terror and adrenaline rush, I lunged at the claw with my hunting knife, thrashing blindly and hoping for flesh or anything still alive on that malevolent being. For a moment, the grip loosened and Agamemnon slipped free, but we both knew there was no time for relief or celebration. It had found us. The game was far from over. Without a second thought, we stormed up the stairs and clambered through that narrow window, our hearts hammering against our rib cages. Sprinting deeper into the forest, any thought of escape or rescue dwindled with each passing second. Suddenly, a guttural howl tore through the icy silence. Our beast had discovered our treachery. It was gaining on us when we stumbled across an old ranger station. Accompanied by an eerie sense of hope, we locked ourselves in. The monster roared and clawed at the fortified entrance. The walls shook with its persistent rage. As Agamemnon tended to his wounds and I tried desperately to phone for help again, we heard something else. Footsteps outside the station accompanied by human voices. The monster halted its attack and slipped away into the darkness just as quickly as it attacked. We flung open the door to see two park rangers approaching, 
their befuddled expressions quickly shifting to unease upon seeing our bloodied state. We recounted our harrowing experience in hushed tones, suspecting they wouldn't have believed us if we weren't horrifically beaten survivors of this terrifying encounter. Though puzzled by our story, dismissing it as an animal attack peppered with hysteria, they escorted us to their truck, radioing for support. As we drove further from that forsaken cabin, Agamemnon and I exchanged uneasy glances with the dawning realization that no one would ever truly believe us, that there was something out there beyond explanation or logic occupying those untamed woods. Months later, even now with my heart still pounding in my ears whenever I recall those memories etched painfully deep within me, I can only attribute those events to a cruel, unimagined twist of fate. An encounter with a primal force, a perverted life form beyond our known world deemed far too dreadful to exist in it. For both Agamemnon and me, that forest will remain an enduring reminder of our brush with an unfathomable darkness, and the unanswered questions that polluted our reality in an unrelenting whirlwind. I woke up early that morning, still aching from helping my cousin Joanne move into her new place in Bakersfield. We were both artists, so our conversations drifted around our work and sarcastic opinions about the latest art exhibitions which we attended. The sun leaked through the cabin windows, emphasizing the peculiar color palette created by the redwood surroundings. This beautiful cabin in the northern Californian woods belonged to Uncle Frank. It needed caretaking, and I relished the peace and inspiration it could provide. That day, during my daily walk along the forest path, a strange scene unfolded. I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite, clothes scattered everywhere, tents partially collapsed, a cooking pot tipped over near extinguished fire pit. Alarm bells rang in my head. I sprinted back to the cabin and decided to report it to Sheriff Parker. Joanne worriedly agreed. Something sinister had occurred. Waiting for authorities to arrive, we sat on the cabin's porch when frantic screams echoed from deeper within the woods. Sheriff Parker should be here soon, Joanne muttered hastily. We debated whether to investigate ourselves or wait for law enforcement when suddenly there was total silence. The police searched for days, finding no sign of the missing campers nor determining what happened at that desolate site. Residents exchanged theories about rogue animals or even a deranged man in the forest depths. Anxiety spread through the nearby towns, but life continued. A month later with no leads on the case, a deer carcass appeared at my cabin doorsteps, its body mutilated with precision and cruelty beyond natural predators' capacities. It was as if someone deliberately left it there, a taunting symbol of their sinister nature. That night, unnerved by the discovery, Joanne and I decided not to separate. We locked every door and window in our isolated retreat. In whispered tones sharing dark thoughts either of us wished to voice aloud, we wondered if we should arm ourselves. Days later, our worst fears came to life. Hues of a setting sun painted the forest as shadowy figures emerged from the woods. Wolves but altered. Their form and gestures were grotesque and unnatural. They seemed mutated from any earthly anatomy I'd previously seen or read about more like creations from my darkest nightmares. As they approached the cabin, boils and gashes pulsated in their deformed bodies while emitting a rancid stench that overwhelmed every fiber of my being. The abhorrent beasts circled our once serene retreat with menacing purpose, their eyes staring unnervingly into mine. It felt as though they sensed our fear, feeding on it with each lap around the frail wooden structure. Joe insensibly suggested that we remain silent and hidden in the darkness of the cabin's inner sanctum. 
We hadn't dared call for help for anyone's intervention would be futile against such abominations. Even guns would provide no protection. We stayed there for several hours with no knowledge of when morning would rise or if those moaning creatures lay in wait outside. Time speared by agonizingly slowly with every labored breath and heartbeat reminding us how vulnerable we were in this remote woodland prison. Suddenly, scratching noises echoed close by, like nails scraping across wood. Joan whispered that she barely held herself together. So did I. Our rationality was slipping away, but terror forced us to acute awareness of our surroundings despite the near-crippling dread that threatened to overwhelm us entirely. I noticed a small crack in the cabin's door, just large enough to peer through. Mustering up what little courage I had left, I fought off my trembling hands and leaned in to scout our chances of escaping this wretched place. The deformed wolves were fewer in number now, but still lurked near the cabin. My eye caught one with gnarled teeth that protruded from its mouth painfully, as if it were a mockery of nature itself. Memories of Joanne and me living blissfully in this cabin, ignorant of the horrors that awaited us, only fueled my determination to survive. We had come here to escape mundane city life. How ironic that our safe haven would become our doom. A sudden thunderous impact shook the cabin walls. The door cracked further under the strain. We knew one thing for sure. Those wolves were growing bolder and more ferocious by the minute. Joanne, I whispered hastily. We have to find a way out. But where? She replied, barely forming words through her trembling voice. My mind raced searching for any logical escape plan as the wolves outside clawed their way through the doors and walls. Then it struck me. Perhaps we could lure some away using leftover food supplies as bait. We'll use our remaining food to distract them, I explained hurriedly. Split it up and toss half of it out the back window as far away from here as possible. Then we'll throw the rest out the front door and make a run for it while they're occupied. Joanne paused for a moment, considering her options before nodding silently in agreement. We quickly gathered canned goods and dried meats from our cabinets and divided them as planned. With shaky hands, Joanne threw half out the back window while I kicked the front door open just long enough to throw out the other half before scrambling back inside. In less than a minute, the deformed wolves rushed towards the bait, their menacing growls filling the air as they fought over their unexpected meal. Ready? I asked Joanne, knowing there was no turning back from what we were about to do. She nodded and with a synchronized push, we threw the cabin door wide open once more. The wolves outside had dispersed to fight over their spoils leaving a small window of opportunity for us to flee the carnage that had once been our idyllic retreat. Holding on to Joanne's hand tightly, we sprinted through the forest, torn between sheer terror and hope that our risky plan had bought us enough time. As we pushed ourselves through the dense foliage, we periodically heard the snarls of those hideous wolves not far behind. It seemed our act of desperation had only bought us some time before they came in pursuit. The pursuit lasted for hours until finally, utterly exhausted and out of options, we stumbled upon a park ranger station at the edge of a clearing. Relief washed over both of us as we spotted other survivors inside, farmers who knew the forest well and had been radioing for help from nearby villages. As armed forces arrived to secure the area and attend to our wounds, Joanne and I sought solace in one another's arms. The horrors we just faced made our world feel like it had shattered into pieces. In those few days that followed, we shared our story with others who recounted similar tales, tales of mutated beasts born from unknown origins. People whispered speculations, but ultimately nothing conclusive was drawn about how these monstrosities came to be or why they plague our once tranquil forest home. For Joanne and me, 
this hellish experience became a monument to resilience, a testament that even when faced with unfathomable horrors beyond any earthly comprehension, the human spirit can endure. Although our lives would forever be scarred by that nightmare, we found solace in knowing that we had survived and that, in time, we could rebuild our lives anew. I stretched after a long drive, looking up at the cabin I rented for some much-needed alone time. My name is Marlon Ebersole, and I'm a pharmacist back in a small town in Alabama. The solitude of Harrington Forest in Washington State sounded perfect after that divorce ordeal. As I unloaded my car, a scruffy man maybe in his late sixties ambled over. Looks like you're the new guy in these woods, he remarked. The name's Silas Redding. Nice to meet you, Silas, I replied. He squinted as he stared into the distance. You know, this area has some strange stories. A couple of folks have disappeared and haven't been found. Aren't there hikes and forests everywhere? People tend to get lost sometimes. I pointed out while I unloaded my suitcase. Silas shrugged. Just thought you should know. Thanks for the heads up. I responded with a friendly smile waving goodbye as Silas wandered away. After settling into the cabin, I decided to take a leisurely walk to explore the surroundings. The dense trees, combined with occasional patches of sunlight filtering through the foliage, painted a beautiful picture of nature's handiwork. A sudden crackling sound startled me. As I turned around, I found a deer carcass lying on the ground mutilated beyond recognition. It looked like it had been mauled by a wild animal. Unease building up inside of me, but unwilling to let fear take over, I continued my walk cautiously. In another area of the forest, I discovered an abandoned shack covered in rust and moss. Spying an old newspaper clipping nailed to the wooden wall, I strained my eyes to read. Three campers vanished from Harrington Forest. Search called off. It was dated some years back. Before long, however, I spotted another set of footprints. They ended abruptly, as if someone had just vanished. Standing there, I couldn't shake off that unsettling feeling of being watched but brushed it off as my overactive imagination. That night, while sitting on the cabin porch, I heard rustling in the trees nearby. Peering into the dark shadows... I saw a tall humanoid figure standing eerily still. I felt its piercing gaze freeze me on the spot. The creature's head appeared wolf-like with sharp teeth that seemed to glow menacingly in the moonlight. My instincts screamed to get inside and bolt the door, so I hastily obeyed them. Fumbling with my phone, sweat beating down my brow as terror gripped my heart, I dialed Silas' number attempting to call for help. What's up? He answered gruffly. Silas, I stammered. There's something outside my cabin. ITIT -IT doesn't look human. Calm down, Marlin. You're just scaring yourself. Silas, my voice shook as I tried to maintain composure. I'm not joking around here. Please come over. Bring something to defend ourselves with. All right, he sighed skeptically. I'll be there with my shotgun. Listening closely to any movements outside and racking my brain to identify that creature from folklore or horror movies, I try not to let panic consume me. The sound of knocking startled me back from my thoughts. Opening the door cautiously, Silas barged and a shotgun cradled in his arms. Where's this thing you're so afraid of? He demanded. I don't know, I admitted. It was near the trees over there. Suddenly, deafening growls shook the cabin walls as that monstrous creature lunged from its hiding spot among the darkness with gnarled claws that slashed through the splintering wood. 
Silas aimed his shotgun at the beast and fired as it lunged toward us with alarming speed. Silas' shotgun roared, but the creature seemed unfazed by the blast. Instead, it swiped at him with its claw, gashing his forearm. Silas cried out in pain, his shotgun falling to the floor. With a bellowing roar, the creature's eyes locked onto me. Its twisted visage was haunting. Instead of fur, oily black tendrils writhed around its body like a decaying fringe. The snout was short and blunt, and a trail of shiny black jewel dripped from its maw filled with jagged teeth. Run, Marlin! Silas shouted through gritted teeth as he scrambled for his shotgun. Heeding his advice, I fled the cabin as fast as my legs could carry me. I could hear the creature stomping after me, and its guttural growls shook my very essence. As I burst into a clearing near my cabin, a family of deer darted out of my path. So this is what they were fleeing from earlier. Fueled by adrenaline, I continued sprinting, my heart in my throat. In my panic, I did not even grab my cell phone to call for help. After what felt like hours of running and listening to that monster's incessant growls behind me, I saw lights from a nearby road. Salvation. As I approached the road's edge, an unmarked police cruiser happened to drive past, caught by sheer luck. Frantically waving at it, I managed to attract the attention of the two officers inside. They stopped their car and got out, guns aimed at whatever danger they thought was charging after me. "'What's chasing you?' barked one officer authoritatively. "'I don't know.' I spat out between gasps for breath. "'Some monster! It, it attacked Silas!' Without hesitation, one officer radioed for backup while the other ushered me to the safety of their cruiser. As we waited for backup to arrive, the sound of vicious growls emerged. And in the dim glow of the road's single street light, a horrific scene unfolded. Silas had put on a brave face and followed me to the clearing, shotgun still clutched in his bloodied hands. But before he could make it to safety, the creature lunged furiously after him. The officers exchanged a terse glance before unloading several rounds into the beast. Loaded down with buckshot, it recoiled and fled back into the shadows. Backup arrived within minutes. Both animal control and police forces swarmed the area they dubbed the Green Hell. Although Silas was found severely injured, he was alive. When asked about what attacked us, I could only describe what I saw a monster with writhing tendrils and hungry eyes. For a while, our story made headlines. Local news crews flocked to my cabin incessantly with their cameras and interviews. But as time dragged on, interest faded away like wallpapers left out in the sun. Silas eventually recovered from his injuries but left town shortly after his release from hospital. As for me... I moved far away as far away from forests and secluded cabins as humanly possible. The nightmare never faded from my memory entirely. Though I couldn't wage any war against that dark menace nor knew its motivations or weaknesses, I did manage to escape its terrible grasp. A grim urban legend sprouted from our misfortune, tales of malevolent spirits or monstrous animals lurking in the green hell. The fantastical theories involving mutants or cryptids spread like wildfire amongst curious thrill-seekers. And every once in a while as I sit in my city apartment, staring restlessly at old newspaper clippings framed on my wall, I distinctly recall the chilling growls from that nightmarish creature, an unholy amalgamation of man and beast, fueled by some ferocious, primal hunger. Its origin? unknown. Its purpose? To hunt and terrify. Its presence? Still lurking somewhere deep within the forests, far out of sight, but never entirely forgotten.
I stepped out onto the porch, stretching my arms and inhaling the crisp air. Ah, finally some peace and quiet, I thought. My name's Elton Graverly, and I teach history at Mendelton High School down in Louisiana. I had been craving for this vacation to White Pine Creek Reserve for months. The cabin I rented was cozy, one bedroom, a kitchen, and a small living area with a wood stove nestled amongst towering pine trees. There were no other cabins nearby, just how I wanted it. The perfect place to unwind after a long school year full of rowdy teenagers. Instead of catching up on sleep like most people would do on their vacation, I decided to hike towards the creek right away. As I was putting on my hiking boots, I cracked a joke to myself. Teacher by day, nature explorer by weekend, Elton Graverly can do it all. Chuffed with my wittiness, I looked at my reflection in a small hallway mirror just as Mrs. Kriegman's voice echoed in my mind. Walking in these woods alone? There might be serial killers lurking around. Her paranoia always made our colleagues laugh. A mile into the hike, the woods rustled as animals scurried away from my footsteps. Out of nowhere, I stumbled upon what seemed to be an old campsite. Burned logs were scattered around the extinguished fire pit as if someone tried to frantically put off the fire. Torn clothes and crushed bags lay strewn nearby. If that wasn't weird enough, there were no footprints leading to or leaving the campsite. Feeling uneasy and puzzled, I couldn't help but think about Mrs. Kriegman's words. Maybe there was some truth to her paranoid fears. Trying not to overthink it, I continued with my hike but stored that grisly scene to share with her later. The further I walked, the darker the skies seemed to become. The once clear babbling of the creek dwindled until it became eerily silent. As sunlight filtered through the dense trees, casting odd shadows on my path, tension built within me. This was not how my serene retreat was supposed to feel. Then suddenly, something caught my attention just at the edge of my peripheral vision. I turned to see what it was but there was nothing, just an odd-shaped rock jutting out from a mound of leaves. Nothing in this place seemed to make sense. The abandoned campsite the eerie silence, and now this peculiar rock formation convinced me that it was time to return to the cabin. On my way back, various images played in my head, scenarios with monsters or slashers waiting for me around each trunk. Even though my mind conjured up these frightful thoughts, I knew deep down that they were unreasonable. When I finally reached the cabin— I felt relief flood through me as if I'd crossed into some kind of safe zone. Then something moved near my periphery again, but this time had ventured too close to ignore. I saw it in full view, a creature unlike anything I could have imagined. It stood on two legs like a man but had elongated arms like those reaching for an embrace. Its skin resembled a snake's hide and shone an unnatural sheen in the sun's rays. Its eyes gleamed an abyssal black that seemed to bore right through me. It lifted one arm, gently turning its head as if gauging my reaction. In that moment, all logic and reason escaped my trembling body. Nobody had encounters like this. There had always been explanations for strange things witnessed by anyone who ventured into natural reserves like this. Animals scavenging abandoned campsites or periodolia causing people to see things in shadows that weren't really there. Any rational explanation for what was happening to me vanished as the creature lunged. In sheer disbelief, I stumbled backwards, my fight-or-flight instincts triggered as I struggled to find a footing. My mind spun as every possible scenario I had imagined over the course of my hike now seemed plausible. A blood-curdling scream broke the silence of those once peaceful woods. The realization that it was coming from me was just as terrifying. As the creature closed in, its grotesque features distorted by another primal scream. Desperate, 
I attempted to distance myself from the creature by clumsily stomping through the underbrush. It relentlessly pursued me, the sound of its gnarled, reptilian limbs snapping branches and rustling leaves growing louder and more frenzied as it gained ground. As I pushed through the thicket, my focus remained entirely on survival. Reason eluded me, and instead of calling for help, if only to provide a sense of solace amid the encroaching madness, I could only concentrate on evading this terrifying abomination. Suddenly, I tripped on a protruding root and fell to the ground with a painful impact. The creature drew closer, and I knew that I couldn't keep running. Knowing that defending myself against this beast was likely impossible, I screamed for help at the top of my lungs. My calls echoed through the dense woods for what felt like hours but was likely mere minutes, prayers to anyone or anything that would listen. The creature paused briefly before emitting an ungodly hiss in response to my cries. Its horrific expression remained fixed upon me. There was no empathy or understanding in those dark, soulless eyes. A faint glimmer of hope emerged through the terror as distant voices rushed toward me. Heard over the panic yelps of my pursuer, two hikers happened to be nearby and were now approaching rapidly after hearing my screams. The unexpected arrival of potential reinforcements caught the attention of my assailant. Its head darted back and forth between me and their approaching footsteps. The voices grew louder, and just as my rescuers emerged from their hiding places in the tree lean, our nightmare lunged once more in an attempt to deliver one final act of grisly violence upon its intended quarry. It managed to reach me before they did but lost balance and tumbled off into a nearby ravine during its frenzied assault. My would-be saviors gasped in horror as they took in what had just unfolded. For a few precious moments, everyone remained motionless, attempting to process the traumatic events that had taken place. With the lurking terror gone for now, we didn't waste any time getting far from its potential return. As we ran through the woods together, I quickly filled them in on the danger they had arrived just in time to witness. Their confusion mirrored mine, but all any of us wanted was to be out of that forest. Eventually, we reached a ranger station and explained our ordeal. It was evident that the rangers could hardly believe our tale but had no choice but to investigate due to the gravity of our claims. Later, during their search of the area where I'd encountered the beast, they found something unnatural, shed scales and tufts of coarse hair unlike anything they had ever seen before in those woods. Though this evidence supported my story and caused concern among personnel, identifying the creature proved elusive for even experienced specialists. As unsettling as my experience had been, life continued. The forest was put under strict surveillance as authorities tried to make sense of what happened, but no solid answers came forth. The creature vanished as enigmatically as it appeared, leaving only fear in its wake. Though I was grateful for having survived my ordeal with the creature, who would remain an enigma forevermore, unanswered questions nod at me and cause sleepless nights laden with unyielding dread. My thoughts turned occasionally to the possibility that more creatures like it could be lurking in other parts of the world, emerging from impenetrable shadows or dense underbrush just as silently and unexpectedly as it did that fateful day. Regardless of any ultimate conclusions, one fact remains clear. Life had thrown a curveball in my direction when I least suspected it during that otherwise normal hike through those seemingly peaceful woods. While I could never truly understand or predict the whims of fate, I knew with an unwavering conviction that I owed my continued existence to the courage and timely intervention of two fellow hikers heeding my desperate pleas for help. I stood in the doorway of my recently acquired cabin, 
taking in the isolation of the surrounding woods. My name is Eugene Kasprovich, and I came to escape the city's noise and chaos after my divorce. A few days into my stay, I learned about a group of missing persons who had rented a nearby cabin. Just like that time in Rextonford Grove, I mumbled, recalling a similar story told by a co-worker. One day, as I ventured deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. Tattered clothes littered the ground, while traces of blood painted the scene with an ominous urgency. Feeling unsettled, I decided to return to my cabin. There, a neighbor named Matthew McElroy introduced himself over dinner. He mentioned stories about mysterious deaths and disappearances that have plagued these woods for decades. Blame it on old man Redding's farm, Matthew said with a chuckle. Rumor has it he created some kind of mutated beast that haunts these woods. Late at night, odd sounds shattered the silence. Rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and guttural growls filled the air. I dismissed them as coyotes or raccoons since stories about monstrous creatures are mostly fictional. On one stormy night, the noises grew closer and more sinister. Tensed up in my chair by the fireplace, gripping an old hunting rifle I purchased locally, it seemed like protection might be necessary. The eerie darkness suffocated me as yells broke through. It was your standard horror movie character Alec Duquesne in need of help. Pleading for assistance with bloodied hands pressed against my windowpane. It got Lorenza! He shouted in terror. You have to help me! Together through sheets of rain coming down fast over us, we hurried back towards Lorenza Austin's lifeless body sprawled nearby. Alec explained how some sort of creature attacked them while camping. We lugged Lorenza's body back to my cabin, where we tended to Alec's wounds. I recalled what Matthew said about the deaths and missing persons. A newfound terror weighed heavy upon me. What on earth? I muttered skeptically as I bolted the door shut. Matthew's crazy stories can't be real, right? Alec... Looking pale with fatigue and fear agreed. Yeah, if it weren't for your help, I... His sentence cut short as the cabin shook with violent force like something rammed against it, the growling more threatening than before. As we stared horrifically out of the window, our hearts pounding in sync, we caught a fleeting glimpse of a hideous creature. Standing like a man but covered in thick fur and fangs protruding from its elongated snout. There's no way that's what Matthew was babbling about, some mutated beast. Alec shouted. What do we do? I glanced at the hunting rifle and cursed under my breath. Maybe this will slow it down, if not. Well, it's better than nothing. I grabbed the rifle, checking to see if it was loaded, while Alec fumbled with the first aid kit, wrapping bandages tightly around his wounds. The creature outside seemed to circle the cabin, snarling and growling as it moved. I need to call for help, Alec muttered, reaching for his phone. Signal, I reminded him. Out here in the woods? Unlikely. He frowned and tried anyway, cursing when the call failed to connect. What do we do now? he asked. We need to get out of here somehow. Find a safe place or at least put some distance between us and that thing. I replied, trying to sound more confident than I felt. We waited until the sounds of the creature seemed farther away from the cabin. Then, as silently as we could manage, we slipped out through the back door and took off into the woods. Each snap of twig underfoot or rustle of leaves caused our heart rates to spike, fearing that the creature would be upon us at any moment. Over time, our adrenaline-fueled energy began to dwindle. Alec's wounds were taking their toll on him. He was losing blood, and I could tell he was in pain despite his determination not to show it. 
We found a hiding spot within a thick cluster of bushes. It wasn't ideal, but considering our dire circumstances, we didn't have much choice as we needed some time to rest. As we sat there catching our breaths and trying not to make any noise, I formulated a plan. We head back to town once it's light enough for us to see properly. It's safer than stumbling around in the dark. Alec nodded his agreement, too exhausted to argue. The night ticked by slowly as we remained on high alert for any sign of the creature. We could occasionally hear distant growls echoing through the woods, but so far it didn't seem to find us. Finally, the first light of dawn filtered through the trees, and we knew it was time to move. Silently, bloodied and beaten, we pressed on toward civilization. As we walked, Alec recounted what had happened to him and Lorenza before they were attacked. They were camping at a nearby campground when the creature emerged from the forest, just like Matthew's stories. The creature moved swiftly and before they even could process what was happening, Lorenza was torn apart. Alec barely escaped with his life. Our journey back to town was thankfully uneventful besides Alec nearly collapsing several times due to blood loss and exhaustion. It took hours for us to make it back to the safety of civilization. Upon our arrival, we immediately contacted the authorities about their encounter with the creature. An extensive search of the woods ensued, with animal trackers and expert hunters scouring the area. But as one day turned into two, then three, with no sign of any unknown creature or Lorenz's body ever found. Though encouraged by the dwindling presence of that menacing growl over time, we couldn't shake that sinking feeling in our gut that lingered on after each terrible night spent in anticipation. It felt like a nightmare with no end in sight, an enigma unpredictably morphing into reality right before our eyes. Following exhaustive questioning from investigators and more than a few skeptical looks from friends and acquaintances alike, they eventually categorized Lorenza as missing and concluded that he most probably fell victim to a horrific animal attack. Alec decided to move away from town soon after. Either of us could bear to live so close to that forest anymore. Though most nights still left me startlingly awake at the slightest sound outside my windowpane, I'd hear a distant whispered echo of what sounded all too eerily like that terrifying growl. It eventually faded into obscurity alongside quickened heartbeats. Part of me is glad the search didn't yield results, and yet I can never truly find peace knowing that the creature that killed Lorenza is still out there, lurking somewhere among the shadows. The memory of his lifeless body and that haunting creature serve as a chilling reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. However, no amount of unanswered questions will ever bring Lorenza back. But one thing is certain, we'll never forget him, and he'll always be in our thoughts. I stood at the edge of the forest, gazing at the old wooden cabin that would be my home for the next few weeks. The idea of a vacation in rural Oregon seemed refreshing, away from my mundane daily routine as an insurance agent. My name's Gordon Petherbridge, by the way, just your average guy looking for solace within nature. The cabin's charm was undeniable. It looked like something right out of a classic movie. The wood creaked as I stepped onto the porch and turned the key to unlock my temporary sanctuary. As night approached, I decided to cook dinner in the cabin's rustic kitchen. Aware of my limited culinary skills, I opted for a simple pasta dish that would be hard to mess up. I enjoyed my meal with a glass of wine and amused myself with an old book I found on a dusty shelf. On the second day, during my solitary exploration of the area around the cabin, I discovered a shallow creek hidden between thick trees and overgrown bushes. Scooping up water in my hands to take a sip, something caught my attention downstream. 
a strange creature peeked out from behind a large boulder. It was about six feet tall with four legs and long arms ending in sharp claws. Figuring it was some wild animal native to this area, I pulled out a pocket-sized notebook and started drawing a detailed sketch of its appearance, hoping to identify it later on. Back at the cabin that evening, I pulled out my phone, surprising myself with full bars despite being isolated from civilization, and called Marsha Phillips, an old friend who happened to be an expert in wildlife biology. Marsha tried her best to help but said she couldn't place it among known species. Days passed as I grew accustomed to my life in the woods. However, what initially seemed like peaceful solitude slowly started unraveling into feelings of uneasiness primarily due to an unsettling recurring dream. I kept finding myself face to face with the creature I saw by the creek. Each day, I noticed scratch marks on trees and large footprints near the cabin. As much as I wanted to believe it was a figment of my imagination, the evidence suggested otherwise. With doubt creeping in, I called my buddy Diego, who worked as a detective in Portland. After explaining my situation, he encouraged me to set up some cameras around my place, assuring me they'd likely capture footage of a common predator. However, reviewing the videos completely obliterated Diego's theory. From multiple angles, there it was, the hideous creature with razor-sharp claws and an emotionless gaze stood at the edge of my sanctuary for hours, resembling something out of a gruesome horror flick. The revelation gave way to panic. My grip on reality loosened as paranoia engulfed me. I knew that this creature would forever haunt me unless I somehow confronted it. Sleepless nights went by as images of the creature consumed my thoughts. Unable to bear it any longer, I armed myself with a shotgun and stalked its trail through the woods each night despite fearing the unknown. Then, finally, after what seemed like an eternity spent chasing shadows, I found it, or rather, it found me. Its horrifying visage stood right before me. My heartbeat hammered in my chest as sweat trickled down my brow while carefully aiming at the horrendous thing staring me down. I took a deep breath and steadied myself, my finger trembling on the trigger. As I prepared to fire, an unnerving thought flashed through my mind. What if the creature didn't die? What if it became more aggressive and attacked me? My legs felt weak at the prospect, but I knew there was no turning back now. Suddenly, the creature lunged at me. Instinctively, I fired the shotgun, but I missed. The creature's massive body collided with mine, knocking me to the ground. At that point, I desperately wished I had called for help before sealing my fate. The creature pinned me down and leaned in closer, allowing me to take in every horrifying detail of its face. Its skin looked like it was peeled back from its skull. Void eyes seemed to pierce my soul. Sharp fangs protruded from a disfigured mouth. The simple truth hit me. I wasn't equipped to fight this creature alone. Fueled by terror and adrenaline, and without thinking about admitting defeat— I managed to push the creature off of me just long enough to scramble back to my feet and sprint towards my cabin. As I ran inside and slammed the door shut behind me, I could hear the creature scratching at the wood. I quickly grabbed my phone and dialed Diego's number again. Even though Diego's guess about the animal turned out wrong, he could still help with his connections in law enforcement. Diego! You have to help me. That thing is not just an animal. It's something else. I stammered into the phone, breathless with heart pounding against my ribcage. All right, man, all right. Just hold on, Diego replied urgently. I'll call some authorities from your area right now. Stay inside and stay safe. I hung up the phone with shaking hands and tried to focus on anything but the unnerving sounds outside my cabin. Images of the creature's face continued to haunt my thoughts. 
It felt like an eternity passed before the police arrived, searching the area while I recounted my terrifying ordeal to them. As the officers combed the woods, they found signs of the creature's presence, scratch marks, uprooted trees, large footprints. Despite their efforts, they couldn't locate it. After a few days, the investigation wound down without any definitive answers. With no sight of the creature but ever-present fear in my mind, I realized I couldn't bear living in that cabin anymore. I called Diego to let him know I was leaving. Man, I can't stay here anymore, I said solemnly into the phone. But thanks for helping me when it mattered. Don't mention it, Diego replied, his voice firm yet reassuring. You just take care of yourself out there. If that thing ever comes back, call me. With a heavy heart and lingering apprehension, I packed up my belongings and left my once serene retreat behind. Diego's offer of help held a small amount of comfort, but the fact remained that safety was only provisional for me now. As time went on and life moved forward, the terror gradually faded into a dark recess of my memory, though never entirely forgotten. The gruesome and fearsome encounter remained a terrifying reminder of something inexplicable that lurked in our world. From time to time, I would stare at a distant tree line or into dense woods and couldn't help but wonder if that hideous creature still lurked out there somewhere, simply waiting for its next opportune moment to strike or perhaps already tormenting another victim elsewhere. Not knowing whether the creature was dead or alive was unsettling. Regardless, one thought remained crystal clear. Taking on such an antagonist alone sealed a fate that is better escaped than confronted head-on. Though faced with grief over leaving what was the safety of my sanctuary, my journey forward was just another chapter in a larger story of survival. I knew that in the face of complete unknown and unimaginable danger, relying on the support and assistance of those around me is the only way for any hope of survival. And as long as I continued to do so, I'd tread a path where escape is still an option and where the unknown horror can't lay claim to any more victims. I woke up to the sound of birds chirping, stretching as I got out of bed. My name is Wesley Dunmore, and I always dreamed of having a cabin in the woods a perfect sanctuary from my otherwise busy city life. So, I decided to take a break and rented this beautiful wooden hideout just outside Piney Woods, Texas. Cabin life had been great, with serene views and nature all around. Everything was peaceful, until that fateful incident a few days ago. An odd article in the local newspaper caught my attention. Someone found a mutilated body in the woods nearby. That piece of news chilled me to the bone. On that same day, while taking an evening walk to clear my mind, I heard footsteps behind me. Startlingly close, I whipped around only to find nothing but trees and fading light. Whoever it was must have vanished into the shadows before I could glimpse them. Uneasy conversations between neighbors soon emerged. Somebody whispered about a hiker who had gone missing weeks ago and was never found. Neither were some others who were believed to have wandered into these woods and simply disappeared. But none of those things prevented us from bonding, like when Barry Grimson hosted a barbecue, or Katie Ambrose held art classes at her home. Yesterday evening, while chatting with my new pal Eunice Wittenberg over a homemade brew, she jokingly suggested that there was some kind of gruesome wood creature feasting on human flesh hereabouts. If only it were something that simple, I chuckled nervously. We laughed in spite knowing that no one ever called for help because there was no use cell phone reception was non-existent here. When it got late, we bid adieu as our unease lingered. Today felt different. A fog had descended on the woods, 
casting an eerie blanket over everything colors muted and visibility reduced. As dusk approached time seemed to slow down, amping up my dread with each passing hour. That night, while trying to catch some sleep, I heard it again, those footsteps. This time I wouldn't chicken out. Grabbing a flashlight and a pistol I kept for emergencies, I ventured into the foggy woods to confront the mysterious presence. At the edge of the clearing, I saw it. The creature was massive, standing almost seven feet tall with long arms that nearly touched the ground. It had thick, gnarled skin and beady red eyes that glinted in my flashlight's beam. Worst of all was its gaping maw filled with razor-sharp teeth. Wesley, are you out there? Eunice's voice echoed through the fog. She stumbled into my path clutching an old shotgun tightly as if her life depended on it. Eunice! What are you? My voice trailed off as I noticed the ominous shadows in near proximity, unwilling to reveal them to Eunice. As she approached closer, I awkwardly blurted out a joke to keep everything casual. As so why do they call Texas the Lone Star State, huh? It feels more like the Wood Star State. A tense laugh escaped her lips as she replied, Well, Wes, now we are just unable to appreciate the stars. Following my gaze into the fog where something lurked large and hungry, Eunice and I hid behind a tree as the creature crept around the clearing, its long arms brushing against the ground. It moved toward our direction, its mouth opening and closing with guttural growls. Neither of us dared to make a sound. It felt as if even our breathing would give away our hiding spot. The creature stopped in the middle of the clearing and sniffed the air. I realized that this was our chance to escape. Whispering to Eunice, I told her to slowly back away and head back to my house without making a sound. She nodded, her eyes filled with terror but determination. As we began making our way back, each step felt like an eternity. The fog surrounding us made it difficult to see too far ahead, but I knew we were heading in the right direction. The creature hadn't seemed to notice our retreat so far. Suddenly Eunice tripped on a root and let out a small gasp. I turned toward her in panic just in time to see her expression change from fear to horror as she stared at something behind me. My heart stopped when I heard the sound of footsteps approaching fast. I knew that we wouldn't make it if we tried running now. Thinking quickly, I told Eunice to hide behind a nearby tree while I made noise to distract the creature. Though she hesitated at first, she could see the determination on my face and agreed. As Eunice hid behind the tree, I banged the flashlight against the rock and yelled as loud as I could in hopes of drawing its attention away from her. The creature rushed toward my location and stood in front of me, its red eyes locking onto mine. Our eyes locked for what seemed like an eternity before it lunged at me with its gaping maw. Instinctively, I raised my arm defensively, and it clamped down hard on it with its razor-sharp teeth. The pain was excruciating, but I managed to push my other arm forward, letting loose a gunshot from my pistol. The creature howled in agony, releasing its grip on me and staggering backward. With the gunshot still ringing in my ears, I could hear Eunice calling for help in the distance. Thank God she had made it far enough to call for help. I looked back at the injured creature and tried to make sense of what it was. It seemed human in some ways, but with traits that were far beyond comprehension. As it writhed on the ground, it stared directly at me with those beady red eyes, its expression becoming one of pure rage. Police sirens began to wail in the distance as I limped away from the creature, my injured arm numb and throbbing. Finally, after what felt like a lifetime, officers arrived on scene along with Eunice. The creature had disappeared, leaving only a trail of its own blood behind. As we recounted our horrifying encounter to the officers, 
They mentioned that there had been reports about similar creatures lurking around a lab facility not too far away from our town. They assumed that it might have been an experiment gone wrong or something utterly unexplainable. After undergoing treatment for my injuries, Eunice and I decided to leave town for our own safety and peace of mind. Despite being alive, either of us could shake off the gruesome memories of those woods and that nightmarish creature. In memory of those who passed away in our town due to this terrifying ordeal, we chose to dedicate our lives to researching into these unexplained events and creatures, trying to understand them while making sure others stay safe from such horrors. But no matter how much knowledge we gain or what explanations are given for these abnormal occurrences, one thing remains clear. Our world is full of inexplicable mysteries beyond our understanding. I woke up to the chirping of birds outside my cabin in the woods. It was a day like any other. My name is Jeremiah Woolston, a city guy who decided to leave the hustle and bustle of urban life for some peace and tranquility. This cabin, located near Mount Shasta in Northern California, was the perfect getaway. It had been a month since I moved here, and I was truly enjoying the solitude. As I went about my morning chores chopping firewood, fetching water from the nearby stream I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. I heard rustling in the bushes near the edge of my property, and cautiously approached to investigate. What I found shook me to the core. There, between intertwined branches and leaves, were remains, but not of an animal you'd think to find here. These were human limbs mangled and torn apart as if by a creature with immense strength and a lust for bloodshed. The horror unfurling within me was indescribable. This carnage belonged in a nightmare, not in my secluded paradise. I pulled out my cell phone but realized there was no signal. I needed to find higher ground to make an emergency call. As I searched for a spot with reception, Every snap of a twig or gust of wind sent chills down my spine. Finally reaching a hilltop, I managed to dial 911 and inform them of my terrifying discovery, pleading for their assistance. As night fell, officers arrived at my cabin yet their demeanor only heightened my unease. One officer, Christy Sampson, shared her findings. We've had reports of similar incidents over the last few years scattered all over this area. She paused before continuing hesitantly. Some people say it's an ancient legend come true, a beast-like creature that roams these woods. The description mirrored Jeremiah's experience, yet despite feeling all the disbelief a creature like that could inspire, he remained skeptical. Doubtful it could help, we reluctantly agreed to spend the night at my cabin as a precaution. Part of me hoped for comfort in numbers while the other part feared we were inviting danger. We lit a bonfire and began conversing to ease our rattled nerves. Suddenly, distant screams cut through the quiet night. The officers exchanged uneasy glances before deciding they had to investigate the source. The look in Officer Samson's eyes was an unmistakable blend of fear and determination as she asked me to stay behind. Moments after their departure, I found myself too anxious to simply wait. Arming myself with a hunting rifle, I followed their path. The heavy silence of the woods was peppered by an unnatural calm each step further drove home the fact that we were not alone. I spotted them crouched in a clearing. They discovered another mutilated body, this time fresher than the last. To our horror, we realized it belonged to one of our own, an officer sent ahead earlier to get a head start on his shift. Watchful and alert, we began moving towards the cabin when out of nowhere it struck, a hulking nightmare that nightmares would fear. Covered in black matted fur, standing on two legs like a twisted evolution gone awry neither wolf nor man, 
It charged at Officer Sampson with terrifying speed. The air around us hung heavy with pure terror as the creature closed in on its prey. Barely giving her enough time to scream, it lunged without warning straight for her throat. Desperate to save my newfound friend, I squeezed the trigger and fired, grazing its flank but nowhere near enough to stop its murderous intention. Despite my best effort, the bullet barely grazed the creature. Officer Samson desperately tried to fight off the monstrous attacker, but it was of no use. The thing was too strong and fast, unfazed by our attempts to fend it off. It swiftly overpowered her and sank its teeth deep into her neck. Her pained cries prompted Officer Thompson to react. He fired his weapon at the creature, finally managing to hit it in the chest. The beast reeled back, releasing Samson from its vice-like grip. Her lifeless body fell to the ground with a sickening thud. Get Officer Winston! Now! Thompson commanded as he continued shooting at the abomination that now started advancing towards him. I rushed back as fast as my shaking legs would carry me, hoping against hope that we could somehow contain this horror show before it claimed any more of us. My breath caught in my throat when I found Officer Winston lying face down in a pool of blood near our bonfire. My world spun. Within moments our group had been decimated by this thing. Our chances seemed further and further away as more officers fell victim to its fury. Feeling helpless, I quickly grabbed Winston's radio and called for backup. Emergency! We need immediate assistance! My coordinates are coordinates. There's a dangerous creature attacking us. Officers down! I dreaded what would come next but couldn't risk remaining immobile any longer. I sprinted back towards Thompson's location, rifle in hand and fear seizing my every move. When I arrived, Thompson had managed to force the creature into a wooded area using his gunfire to momentarily disorientate it. We were outmatched and terrifyingly unprepared for this confrontation, a realization which only grew heavier and more suffocating with each passing second. With no time for words, we quickly began identifying strategic points where we could set traps designed to restrict the monster's movements, slow it down, or potentially injure it. If we couldn't face the creature head-on, then we'd have to think smarter. As night settled like a heavy weight upon us, backup finally arrived, bringing hunters and trackers from the local area who were more familiar with the woods and its inhabitants. Although they had never encountered anything like this monstrosity before, their specialized knowledge would be key in our strategy to capture or, if necessary, kill it. Thompson coordinated the search operation, while I updated the other officers on our losses. Samson's throat was shredded, Winston had multiple lacerations across his torso and was missing an arm. The sight of their mangled bodies still haunted my every thought. Hours ticked by as we tracked the creature through the dense forest. It was wounded from Thompson's earlier shots but continued to move with infuriating speed and cunning for something so large and damaged. Exhaustion weighed heavily upon us but eventually we found our quarry. Surrounded by officers with rifles aimed at its monstrous form, it snarled at us its once black furred features now marred with sticky blood. Now! Thompson barked and fired simultaneously alongside everyone present. The barrage brought it down, groaning in agony as it finally succumbed to its wounds. A tense silence blanketed us as we stared at its lifeless form. It looked vaguely humanoid but distinctly wrong. Matted fur clung to its body, torn in places from the attack revealing patches of thick flesh beneath. Its face looked human enough save for gaping jaws lined with rows of razor-sharp teeth. Its limbs longer than a man's, armed with massive razor-sharp claws. 
We did not know what it was perhaps some hideous offspring born of a twisted experiment gone awry or an undiscovered species lurking deep within the shadows of these woods. All we knew was that it was now dead, along with many of our fellow officers. As we stared, a mix of relief and mourning weaved itself around us. Would this nightmare truly end? Or would we forever be haunted by the memory of this terror? While cleaning up the scene and dealing with the aftermath of a night filled with death and confusion, I silently prayed that no other monstrosities like this one would ever rear their ugly heads again. The cost had been far too great. I was never one to crave isolation, but the city's constant noise and chaos forced me to flee to this cabin in Redwood National Park. Respite sounded nice, but my friends called me crazy. I'm time in Gilman. I blame my inherited wanderlust for these reckless decisions. Exhausted, I stumbled out of the cabin with my trusty binoculars by my side. Forest birds were conducting their daily symphonies, and I couldn't help but sing along. Peace, finally. But something felt off. Since there was no cell reception in these woods, calling for help wasn't an option. It left an odd taste in my mouth, like that time I accidentally ate raw chicken, queasy flashbacks. Nature wasn't meant to be peaceful. It was wild. My father used to tell me that survival instinct could set you free from all your worries. Perhaps now was the time to put that revelation to test. As I ventured further into the woods, the sunlight dimmed. Trees soared above me like supernatural watchtowers. Something gnawed at me, too quiet for nature's rhythm. My gut twisted as I scanned my surroundings. I spotted a torn piece of cloth snagged on a sharp branch. A wave of terror washed over me, fresh blood dripped onto the forest floor below it. Hastening back towards the cabin, I stumbled upon my neighbor's door hanging off its hinges. The once warm and inviting dwelling had transformed into a twisted cluster of splintered wood and shattered glass, an artist's masterpiece reimagined through darkness and sorrow. Roxana Parsley! I shouted, hoping she had merely encountered a curious bear with terrible manners. No answer. My racing heart forced me closer to the wreckage when suddenly a deafening roar echoed from deep within the forest. My blood froze, instinct kicked in stronger than ever before. The woods came alive in a new, terrifying way. A massive creature, roughly the size of an adult moose, burst into my sight. Its scaly skin glinted under the dappled sunlight and razor-sharp claws slashed through the forest brush as it lumbered towards me. I sprinted back to my cabin, desperately trying to distance myself from this monstrosity pursuing me with a predatory hunger and its grotesque, misshapen eyes. In that horrifying moment, I wished I had a gun at hand. I heard my father's voice echo in my head. Survival instinct can set you free. Adrenaline carried me over fallen branches and through prickly bushes. I could hear the creature growling just behind me, its massive form crashing through the undergrowth. As I neared my cabin door, I paused for a moment. If I couldn't call for help or even believe this beast existed, how could I confront it alone? It was clear that there was no other option. Gather your wits and find a weapon. I lunged into the cabin and rummaged through drawers, shelves, and containers, anything to buy myself more time. My hands landed on an old hunting knife with a reassuring weight. My breasts were shallow as I gripped the knife tighter. Survival at any cost. Laughter bubbled up from somewhere deep within me. Because if you don't laugh in the face of danger... What else are you supposed to do? With the knife in my hand, I glanced out the window and saw the creature had stopped its pursuit, 
staring at me with those misshapen eyes. I knew it was calculating its next move, preparing to strike. My heart pounded in my chest, and it took everything in me not to freeze in fear. Instead of trying to flee the cabin again, I decided to barricade myself inside, sliding heavy furniture against the door and windows. Meanwhile, shouts from my neighbors reached my ears. They must have caught sight of the monster. Run! I yelled through a small opening to them. Get far away from here! Call for help! My neighbors didn't hesitate and sprinted in different directions while pulling out their phones. I hoped help would arrive soon, though my father's voice reminded me that survival was ultimately up to me. A thundering crash reverberated through the cabin as the creature barged through one of the windows, sending shards of glass flying. I brandished my knife and braced for its attack, ready for a struggle if it decided to charge at me. It lunged and knocked over a bookshelf, enraged by the item I held. Its claws scratched aggressively across the wooden floor as it tried to reach me. Suddenly, myriad sirens rang out in the distance. Help was on its way. The creature seemed distracted by the sound, allowing me a momentary advantage. It hesitated before making a hasty retreat back through the window. I heard voices outside first responders assessing the situation and forming plans of action against this unknown threat. They shouted orders to each other with steady precision. Stay inside, one of them called to me. Do not come out until we tell you it's safe. I nodded my affirmation even though they couldn't see me. Moments later, I heard gunfire echoing through the woods followed by pained roars from the creature. It became apparent the beast was relentless. Bullets wouldn't stop it. Suddenly, a group of people in tactical gear rushed inside my cabin. Is anyone injured? A woman in uniform asked me, removing her helmet to reveal a tangle of red hair. We're here to contain the creature. No injuries, but it's still out there. I replied, shaking but grateful for the help. After that night, the creature disappeared as mysteriously as it had arrived. Injured but not defeated by human intervention, our first responders assumed that the creature retreated deep into the forest after such a confrontation. They advised everyone to stay indoors while they coordinated a wide-scale search for that monstrous creature. Days turned into weeks without any sign of my assailant and it felt like life was returning to normal despite our lingering uncertainties. Some of my neighbors packed their belongings and left town, unable to cope with memories of that terrifying encounter while others remained vigilant to combat that terror once again if necessary. As for me, I remembered those who tried to call for help on that fateful day, my neighbors who fled in terror but saved our lives in doing so. I wondered if that creature would ever truly be gone or would continue to haunt us from the shadows of the forest. With each passing day, I knew one thing for sure, life would never be quite the same again due to the horror brought forth by that unknown beast. My father's voice still echoing in my mind reinforced my determination to be ready for whatever came next. Survival instinct can set you free. I stared at the breathtaking vista from the cabin porch, marveling at the beauty of the dense Oregon forest that surrounded me. I had rented this isolated cabin for a few weeks to escape my mundane routine as a software engineer in San Francisco. My name is Arthur Limond, and I needed space for healing after my recent divorce. The cabin's owner, Agnes Bentley, had told me stories of ancient native tribes that once dwelled in these woods. For a moment, I felt connected to their long-lost history. I chuckled to myself when I thought of my parents. They always said I had an overactive imagination. Days passed with simple routines, 
chopping wood, cooking on an old stove and hiking on narrow trails. One afternoon, as the sky turned hues of pink and orange, I stumbled upon unsettling markings on the trees that seemed too deliberate to be random. Despite my practical nature, the carvings sent chills up my spine. That evening, feeling uneasy yet curious, I ventured deeper into the woods with nothing but a flashlight and my trusted hunting knife. The woods were eerily silent. Even the wind seemed to hold its breath. Unexpectedly, my flashlight flickered and went out. In cold sweat, I scrambled for extra batteries and replaced them as quickly as I could. As the beam flickered back to life, it illuminated an unnaturally large creature that blocked my path. The creature stood on two legs like a man, but was significantly taller, at least eight feet tall with thick matted fur covering its entire body. A pungent stench filled the air around it. Its eyes seemed black as coal and bored into mine with an intensity that paralyzed me with fear. Alerted by my presence, it emitted an ear-piercing howl that resonated through the woods. My pulse raced as adrenaline flooded my veins, but before I could react further, it vanished into the dense foliage. Panicked, I bolted back to the cabin. Upon reaching safety, I barricaded the door with a heavy wooden chair and peered through a crack in the window blinds. The creature was nowhere to be seen, but I couldn't shake the gut-wrenching feeling of being watched. The next day, after unsuccessfully attempting to sleep, I contacted the local ranger station to report my encounter. Though polite and sympathetic, Ranger Jenkins seemed unconvinced by my account and attributed it to an overactive imagination or perhaps a misidentified bear. How often do you hear about people encountering an unfamiliar creature? I laughed nervously over the telephone, trying to conceal my mounting fear. The ranger chuckled in return but hesitantly mentioned a few similar reports in recent years. That evening, as dusk settled over the increasingly ominous forest, I once again found myself compelled to explore my surroundings this time armed with my hunting rifle as well as the knife. Andy Chisholm worked at a small grocery store down in the nearest town, Ladenvale. It's where I had procured some essentials before arriving at the cabin. Remembering that he loved hanging out up by Redstone Creek when off-duty, sipping on craft beers and forging fishhooks for fun with friends, I made my way there hoping he would be around and possibly lend me some comfort. Upon reaching Redstone Creek, I found Andy unresponsive. His body was mangled in a manner that no human could have possibly mustered his internal organs splayed out around him like hideous abstract art. My heart raced as I tried not to gag from the gruesome scene before me. Rushing to Andy's side, I dialed 911 and shouted for help, but the stillness of the woods provided me no solace. My voice fell on no one's ears but my own. This was only between me, Andy's lifeless body, and the unknown creature stalking nearby. I could barely register the operator's questions over the pounding of my heart. There's been a murder at Redstone Creek. I managed to stutter. Immediately, the operator assured me that a team was on its way. Desperate to escape the gruesome scene, I backtracked through the woods towards my cabin. I hurriedly called Ranger Jenkins, scantly telling him about what happened at Redstone Creek before hanging up. Confused and terrified, I scanned my surroundings for any sign of the strange creature or other victims. As I pondered over these events and my terror-stricken thoughts, I noticed something approaching nearby. A fir tree rustled, and from behind it emerged a creature with bulging orbs for eyes locked onto mine. Its elongated arms strained on four legs while its spine twisted into an unnatural curvature. This disfigured beast stood taller than any man or bear I have ever seen. The creature let out a guttural growl and lunged for me with immense force. The only thing separating us now was instinct, 
that primal surge of fear compelling us to fight or flee, and in this case, fleeing was the most reasonable option. As fast as my legs could carry me, I sprinted to my cabin while screaming at the top of my lungs for help, from anyone or anything that could save me from becoming another carcass at Redstone Creek. Finally arriving at my cabin door, shaking hands frantically fumbled with the locks before diving inside and barricading myself within its confines. With great difficulty, I composed myself enough to dial 911 again. The same operator answered the call. A creature attacked me! I screamed. She said help was on its way and advised me to remain inside. The minutes ticked by each one colder and more agonizing than the last. At last, sirens wailed in the distance, snapping me out of my stupor. The paramedics cautiously entered my cabin, and I recounted my harrowing tale to them while they stabilized me. They seemed to be unsure if it was a bear attack or another wild animal that had killed Andy. Once given the all-clear by the paramedics, I rendezvoused with local police officers at the site of Andy's death, who had now cornered off the area. An officer led me aside to question me about the incident. I let my story flow, answering his questions with as much detail as I could muster. Intrigued by my account of the mysterious creature's appearance and behavior, he confided in me that there had been similar reports before. The consensus was that it might be some form of rare or mutated wild animal previously unknown to science. Soon afterward, the rangers arrived at my cabin with Ranger Jenkins leading the team. They listened intently to my gruesome tale and knighted cautiously asked if I had caught sight of the creature's footprints or any tracks left behind during our encounter. Together, we backtracked towards Redstone Creek. Rifles raised and flashlights scanning, finding large bipedal prints throughout our path along with those belonging to something on four legs. It appears as though this creature can change its gait, Ranger Jenkins whispered in disbelief. We continued following these tracks until they disappeared into a dense thicket near an eerie cave entrance on a steep hillside. A month has passed now since that traumatic experience at Redstone Creek. Andy Chisholm's death remains unsolved, although they declared it a wild animal attack. The unidentified creature has not been seen since. It lurks in the shadows, its existence still a chilling mystery to us all. Those involved, including myself, try to go on about their lives. Leyden Vale is slowly healing its wounds, coming together to mourn the loss of Andy, a beloved member of our community. The quietude of Redstone Creek now rests. These waters serve as a reminder of the past while also washing away the gore it once held. Though life moves forward, I cannot forget what I saw that fateful day, a living nightmare that will forever haunt my memory and forever bind me to those eerie woods. It was one of those days when I wished I had stayed at home. A gloomy sky loomed over my head as I stood on the porch of my cabin, which was nestled in the dense woods of Appalachia, specifically in West Virginia. I'd always dreamed of retreating to the wilderness and leaving the hustle behind, but little did I know what awaited me here. My name is Ezekiel Farnsworth, by the way, but people just call me Zeke. Moved out here after my divorce, hoping for a fresh start where I could focus on my fishing hobby and forget about my past. My best friend from school, Ardley Blakesley, came to visit one weekend. We spend our time reminiscing about our wilder days, laughing at each other's ridiculous stories. But as much fun as we were having something felt off. It all started with Ardley's discovery of an unknown animal track outside our cabin door. A strange mixture of fascination and worry occupied my thoughts. 
This creature didn't resemble anything we knew or had ever seen before. Deciding to investigate further, we followed the bizarre tracks into the woods. The deeper we ventured, the more unsettling things became. We stumbled upon an unusual sight, a torn backpack lying discarded on the forest floor. Whoever owned it had left it in ruins, their belongings scattered across an unnerving scene. Our jokes abruptly stopped when we noticed a wallet amongst the debris. Inside was a driver's license belonging to a man named Othniel Burkhill, someone neither Ardley nor I had ever heard of. The thought that crossed our minds instantly was, where could Othniel be? As we continued our search for any signs or clues, we discovered large claw marks high up on several trees and what appeared to be drops of blood on the forest floor leading us deeper into the darkness. What do you think could have done this, Seek? Ardley whispered, anxiety creeping into his voice. I racked my brain, trying to come up with a logical answer. I don't know, Ardley. But whatever it was, I don't think it's something we want to come face to face with. Despite our fears and the bone-chilling cold closing in around us, we pressed on through the trees beginning to wonder if this was such a good idea after all. But our concerns for the missing man's well-being pushed us to keep going. We couldn't have lived with ourselves if we didn't make some effort to find him. The further we walked, the more sinister our surroundings appeared. Just when I was starting to question what kind of creature could have caused such destruction, a guttural growl reverberated through the air. Both Ardley and I instinctively froze at the sound, terror lancing through us. Heart pounding in my chest, I glanced around apprehensively, trying to catch a glimpse of the monster responsible. That's when it emerged from the shadows, a hulking mass of muscle and fur that towered over us both. Its powerful limbs were covered in thick hair matted with dirt and blood. Its eyes glinted like polished obsidian as they locked on to Ardley and me, and its snarling maw revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth capable of tearing through flesh. This thing was no ordinary animal or fabled beast. It was something else entirely. Ardley stammered out in a whisper, though it came out too choked due to panic. W, what do we do? Without missing a beat or thinking twice about our options because there were not many I whispered back. Run. We made a break for it as fast as our legs would carry us. The demon-like beast screeched from behind us, skin crawling and far too close to comfort. We didn't know of any place nearby where we could hide, but the woods were our best bet. As we sprinted through the dark forest, tree branches clawed at our faces, and cold sweat dripped down our brows ardly, and I knew that it wasn't an option to stop and call for help. The beast would surely catch up by then. Ardley and I continued to run, fear fueling our adrenaline, and the monstrous creature hot on our heels. The world around us had narrowed down to our frenzied breaths and throbbing heartbeats. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a small cabin nestled between the trees. We burst through the door, praying for some semblance of safety, and quickly bolted it shut. The creature roared in frustration outside. We scanned the room for possible weapons or tools that could help us fight off this terror, but there were none except a couple of rusty axes clearly not powerful enough to stand against those massive limbs. Panting heavily, Ardley noticed an old landline telephone mounted on the wall, and immediately grabbed a desperation propelled us to believe that it might still work. I'm going to call for help, Ardley frantically told me as they dialed 911. I nodded in agreement it was worth a shot since we had no other choice. To our astonishment, the call connected. Ardley quickly relayed our situation to the operator, who assured us that help was on its way. Yet we knew that it wouldn't arrive fast enough. We needed an immediate solution to survive. 
We decided to search the cabin thoroughly for potential escape routes as every second was crucial. Suddenly, a crashing noise from outside made us shudder. The creature had started aggressively pounding against the door. Going into panicked overdrive, I spotted a hatch on the floor near one of the walls. We desperately pulled it open and found ourselves staring at an underground tunnel just large enough for one person at a time. Not wasting another second, we both climbed down and started navigating through this claustrophobic space as fast as we could, every ounce of strength focused on getting away from that horrifying beast. As we crawled further inside the tunnel's darkness, it continued downhill until we noticed a sliver of light ahead hope surge within us. The tunnel finally opened into a larger space that led out to the other side of the forest. Witnessing the seemingly endless forestry from this vantage point, one could only imagine how such a monstrous creature could exist in this vast ecosystem, preying on unsuspecting victims who ventured too deep into these depths. Climbing out from our underground savior, we saw police lights in the distance. Relief washed over us as we stumbled over and shared our terrifying encounter with the responding officers. Their expressions shifted between disbelief and intense concern as they listened. The police combed every inch of that area but couldn't locate any trace of the massive creature we had described. There were no footprints or claw marks, just a battered cabin door as evidence for what had transpired. Ardley and I stuck to our story despite skeptics dismissing it as exaggerated hysteria. Days after, a hefty search operation led to discovering more victims, much worse off than us, some mauled and others missing without a trace, confirming that something sinister was indeed lurking in that forest. As time went on, theories circulated about what sort of creature could be terrorizing these woods, each more grisly than the last. Some speculated it to be a product of illegal scientific experiments gone wrong while others believed it was perhaps an undiscovered apex predator. The secrecy surrounding its potential existence fueled our nightmares. But one thing was certain oddly, and I forged an unshakable bond through those shared traumatic experiences. We would occasionally lean on each other for support when reality became too much to handle, or when memories resurfaced with haunting precision. We never returned to those woods again. Once was more than enough for a lifetime. Years later, I still catch myself glancing over my shoulder when taking nighttime strolls, an eerie chill shooting down my spine as I remember that heart-stopping night when we were so close to becoming just another set of victims that creature claimed within its territory. No one could ever truly understand what it was like to face such peril until they too stared death in its cold, merciless eyes. And even though there's still no evidence of the true nature of that monstrous beast, Ardley and I know that somewhere out there, possibly lurking in the shadows, it continues to prowl, seeking its next helpless prey. It was just an ordinary weekend when my friends and I decided to visit my cousin Brent McAllister's cabin in Aspen, Colorado. I, Jonathan Tate, needed a break from the monotonous routine of life. We arrived at the secluded wooden cabin nestled among tall trees their leaves creating a symphony, orchestrated by the wind. The cabin was cozy and immediately felt like home. There were four of us Kylie Nichols, Larry Saplings, Bruce Carpenter, and myself. We cracked jokes about our jobs while unpacking our bags and settling into our rooms. That night, we gathered around the fireplace, enjoying a warm meal accompanied by laughter. Everything seemed perfect until we heard a strange noise outside the cabin something rustling in the dense woods. We dismissed it as an animal scavenging and carried on with our evening. The next day, we stumbled upon an abandoned house while exploring the nearby forest. 
It was old, decayed, and reeked of something foul. Upon peeking through a broken window, I noticed bloodstains on the floor and torn clothes scattered everywhere. That evening, Larry reported seeing something unusual in the woods a massive creature moving silently through the shadows. He described it as having long limbs and a hunched posture, but its face remained unseen. Curiosity peaked. We all agreed to investigate further once daylight returned. On day three, we ventured deep into the forest to find any signs of this mysterious creature that stalked our surroundings. Kylie discovered peculiar footprints near a stream unlike anything we'd seen before. A sense of uneasiness settled upon us. As darkness began to fall that night, Bruce spotted someone standing far off in the distance near the tree line. The figure appeared motionless. No discernible features could be seen from where we stood. A sense of fear unlike anything I had ever experienced clenched my gut. Slowly and cautiously, we moved closer to the figure. Only then did we see the terrifying creature in all its gruesome glory. Over eight feet tall, with elongated arms ending in sharp claws, its hairless body covered in thin, leathery skin stretched tight over its skeletal frame. Its eyes were white and lifeless, and its mouth was full of jagged teeth. Instead of calling for help, we knew we had to handle this situation ourselves. Aspen was miles away, and we remembered that there was no cell phone reception in the cabin. Panic set in, but we stood our ground. Remembering that Brent had left a shotgun at the cabin for protection, I encouraged my friends to return quickly to fetch it while I monitored the menacing creature from a distance. Kylie and Larry ran to retrieve the gun as Bruce and I stared at the ghastly creature that now seemed to be stalking us. Time ticked by dreadfully slow as horrifying possibilities consumed our thoughts. When Kylie and Larry finally returned with the shotgun, they looked as if they'd witnessed a murder. Out of breath and on the verge of tears, they gasped their chilling revelation. Bruce's mutilated body lay beside a pool of blood near where the creature had stood his lifeless eyes staring into oblivion. The fear grew exponentially as we realized the creature had silently killed Bruce while watching us all along. It continued to loom in the shadows of the woods, awaiting its next prey. The initial panic subsided slightly as we began to strategize our next move. We knew running wasn't an option, as the creature was nimble and fast enough to catch us. The shotgun in Larry's trembling hands was now our only hope. We have to try to slow it down, so we can escape, I suggested, thinking that this might be our only option. Kylie gulped. How do we do that? Did Brent leave any ammunition? Larry nodded and showed us the pockets of his jacket filled with shells. He had left a handful of rounds in the cabin. I instructed Kylie and Larry to reload the shotgun at all times, while I kept an eye on the gruesome antagonist who'd claimed our friend's life. If it made any sudden moves, we had to be prepared to fire. Guys, there's only one way off this mountain and that's through that narrow trail over there. I pointed out. We need someone to lure the creature away from there so the rest of us have a chance. I'll do it, Larry volunteered bravely, a look of determination across his face. Larry, are you sure? Kylie asked with concern. Yeah, I can do this, he replied firmly. The plan was set into motion. Larry would lure the creature away from the trail, while Kylie and I would use the path down the mountain to search for help. It wasn't ideal, but it was all we could come up with given our desperate circumstances. Larry fired a round into the air to grab the creature's attention. Almost immediately, it began chasing him in hot pursuit. Meanwhile, Kylie and I sprinted for the narrow trail. We raced down the winding path as quickly as possible, casting nervous glances behind us, 
hoping not to see any signs of Larry or that horrible monster. The further down we went without encountering either of them, the more our hearts ached with guilt and fear. We knew that Larry was risking his life for our safety, but there was no time to waste on regrets. As we reached the base of the mountain, we spotted a truck on an adjacent dirt road. Gasping for breath, we prayed that there would be someone inside who could help us. We rushed towards the truck, hearts pounding wildly in our chests. As we got closer, we could see a man behind the wheel who quickly exited his vehicle upon seeing us. Help! Kylie shouted through tears. There's a something up there on the mountain. It attacked our friend. We need help now. I added with equal urgency as I described the creature. It's tall, hairless, and has sharp claws. It just killed our friend Bruce, and another friend is up there trying to distract it. The man's eyes widened as he listened to our plea. He quickly pulled out a walkie-talkie. Ranger Station, Code Red Emergency. He blurted before filling them in on our situation. Within minutes, armed rangers arrived at the scene, grabbing extra guns and ammo before heading back up the trail where we had come from. Kylie and I realized just how fortunate we were that this seasoned ranger had been patrolling nearby. We waited anxiously for hours while the rangers searched high and low for both our monstrous assailant and Larry. Darkness fell over the mountain as we prayed that they could locate both in time. When dawn broke over Aspen Mountain, we breathed a tearful sigh of relief as Larry emerged from the woods with two rangers by his side, battered but alive. I made it, he said weakly with half a smile. Exhausted and quiet after recounting what had happened to them during their launch of an investigation into this unnerving incident regarding an unknown predator hidden deep in the woods, the rangers returned to the station. As we left the mountain, our thoughts were with Bruce, the brave man we lost to that horrifying menace. Despite our long, sleepless nights after the encounter, we found solace in the fact that we had each other and a faint glimmer of hope that never again would anyone have to face the same unknown terror lurking in Aspen. I had just finished my evening meal, a simple recipe I learned from my mother, when I heard a knock at the door. My name is Wilfred Kipling and I'd been living in this old, cozy cabin in the heart of Brackendale Forest, Washington, for three years now. At the door stood a man. His name was Thurston Abernathy, and I knew him as the local police chief. He looked distressed. Wilfred, he said, there have been reports about something strange happening in the woods. Two people have gone missing in the area. What do you want me to do, Thurston? I asked. Join our search party tonight, he replied. Your knowledge of these woods may come handy. So we met at the edge of the forest at around nine in the evening. Our group included Thurston, Deputy Ariella Grantley, a park ranger named Declan Lockwood, and me. As we set off into the woods, we chatted to keep ourselves occupied. Ariella mentioned her family back home in Kentucky and how much she loved her nieces and nephews. The further we ventured into Brackendale Forest, the darker it grew. Eventually, we couldn't help but feel an eerie sensation envelop us, as if something wasn't quite right. Suddenly we stumbled upon something unusual, a torn piece of clothing hanging from a tree branch. A little further ahead there lay a shoe with what appeared like claw marks on it. We continued cautiously when suddenly Declan saw something large crouched near a tree trunk ahead of us. He held his flashlight to get a better look, tall with broad shoulders, covered in thick matted fur and piercing red eyes that seemed to glow menacingly. The creature abruptly charged towards us with incredible speed and strength that left us all petrified. 
Thurston fired his gun at it but missed, causing the creature to shriek in rage before it disappeared back into the darkness. D did you see that? Declan stuttered. What was that thing? Our hearts raced, but we couldn't abandon the search for the missing people now. With our guns at the ready, we ventured deeper into the woods, hoping for more clues without encountering the ghastly creature again. Hours passed with no luck, and Thurston decided to split us into pairs. He took Declan with him, while Ariella and I remained together. That thing was no ordinary animal. Ariella began but stopped when she noticed something ahead. We discovered another shoe, but this time blood stained the ground around it. As we followed a trail of blood and clothes, we heard someone gagging. We discovered Melanie Stenson, one of the missing persons, unconscious and brutally attacked. I held her head in my lap as Ariella radioed for help. As we waited for assistance through what seemed like an eternity, the rustling leaves grew louder. I felt an uncanny presence all around us. Suddenly, the savage creature emerged again, standing on its hind legs and bearing its razor-sharp claws. Ariella fired her gun on impulse as it lunged into the air toward us. It leaped aside just in time to avoid her shot and take cover within nearby bushes. We need to get out of here, Ariella said as suspense towered over us like a dark cloud. We picked up Melanie with immense care and proceeded through treacherous woods with this terrifying entity relentlessly stalking us every step of the way. Ready to defend ourselves at any moment, we carefully navigated our way forward with Melanie cradled in our arms while listening to hallowed rasps of restive breath invading our eardrums from afar. As Melanie lay in my lap, barely conscious, I could see the concern on Ariella's face. Keep an eye on Melanie. I'll try to find a way out of here. She told me as she stepped towards a small clearing further ahead. We knew we couldn't stay in one place for too long out with that creature following us. But Melanie was in no condition to move on her own. With each passing minute, a sense of urgency grew within me to find a way out of these woods. Soon after, Ariella found a narrow path leading to what seemed like the direction of our vehicles. A glimmer of hope arose within us. We carried Melanie as gently as possible while maintaining our pace, knowing it was quite literally a matter of life and death. As we moved along the path, the creature didn't let up. It continued stalking us, hiding just beyond our line of sight. The rustling of the leaves and snapping twigs were constant reminders that it could attack at any moment. Every now and then, it made its presence known by growling loudly from the dense forest surrounding us. Although we couldn't clearly see it in those fleeting moments, we got glimpses of its appearance. Large, muscular, and covered in dark fur with elongated limbs that seemed unnatural for any known animal species. We began hearing faint sounds not far from where we were heading help must be close. This motivated us to pick up our pace even more, ignoring the throbbing pain in our arms from carrying Melanie. We were desperate to reach safety before it was too late. As we neared the edge of the woods, Relief washed over us as we saw police cars and ambulances stationed in the distance. However, our relief was short-lived when suddenly the monstrous creature lunged at us with full force. It came incredibly close to hitting Melanie, swiping its razor-sharp claws just inches away from her, but Ariella managed to push Melanie and me out of harm's way. It was only a momentary dodge— but it bought us enough time to make a mad dash to the safety of the authorities. Once we were in the clear, I glanced back and saw the creature staring at us from the edge of the woods, its deep-set eyes locked onto ours. There was something unnervingly intelligent behind those eyes that seemed unnatural for any predator. With the paramedics attending to Melanie and police gathering statements from us, we knew that it wasn't safe for anyone unless that creature was stopped. 
Despite our exhaustion, Ariella and I insisted on joining a search team assembled by the authorities along with Thurston and Declan, who had managed to reach safety earlier. With firearms ready, we cautiously approached the woods where we had last seen the creature. It had become eerily quiet the sense of being watched was overwhelming. Suddenly, a horrible screeching sound echoed through the trees as the unimaginable happened the beast ambushed one of our team members. The scene was gruesome the lifeless body of Officer Barnes lay on the ground as blood pooled around him. The creature had disappeared again. In silence, we carried Barnes' body back to where our search began. The suffocating feeling hadn't left us we knew that terrifying beast was not finished with us yet. Once proper authorities have dealt with the creature in a more professional manner, Ariella and I were called back and along with Thurston to give our accounts of what had transpired within those woods. We provided descriptions of this seemingly impossible foe leaving out no grisly detail about its appearance or its haunting gaze. The authorities began piecing together an explanation despite having never witnessed anything quite like this before. They came up with theories about possible undiscovered subspecies or maybe even a cruel experiment gone awry. A couple of days later, with the woods now declared off-limits to the public, further searches revealed the remains of at least three more people. Among those identified was James Crawford, another one of the missing persons. The thought of how close we were to meeting the same fate as those poor souls never truly left me or Ariella. And while I feel grateful for having survived, the haunting memories will forever linger in our minds, a reminder that there are things out there that defy comprehension. I drove down the winding road to my destination, the wooden cabin in the heart of Mendocino National Forest. The rattle of my truck engine always calmed me down after a long day at work. My name's Gideon Barkley, by the way. Grew up in a small town, working as an electrician. The cabin was my sanctuary, the same one that has belonged to our family for generations. It was weathered but sturdy. Inside were layers of dust and cobwebs testifying to all those years of memories. This weekend retreat was much needed, but I couldn't shake this strange feeling creeping up my spine. I stepped out of my truck and gathered the supplies from the back seat to last me for two days. The skies began turning darker, casting eerie shadows around. Silently, I chastised myself for being so jittery over nothing. Later that night, a sound woke me up. Leaves rustling? A muffled grunt? I strained to listen through the still air. Nothing. Must have been my imagination. The next morning, I found some deer tracks nearby leading to one of my property lines. Upon closer inspection, I saw that they were mixed with human tracks. I frowned but didn't pay it much mind. I knew some locals occasionally hunted near here. As I walked back inside, I turned on the radio looking for some distraction and maybe a good joke or two from the local stations. They never failed to make me laugh even if sometimes cringe at their humor. Once settled in for another night, as tiredness washed over me like a wave over pebbles on a shore I assumed it would be peaceful. Yet again, I jolted awake. This time it was unmistakable there was somebody out there. Quickly getting dressed, I tried calling 911 but couldn't get any signal this deep in the woods. Grabbing my shotgun, I opened the door and shouted, demanding to know who was out there. My heartbeat drummed in my ears as I scanned the surrounding darkness for threats. The leaves rustled again this time closer followed by a blood-curdling growl. And then I saw it, gigantic, mangy, and unlike anything I had ever witnessed before. 
This creature towered over me with multi-layered teeth gaping out from its hideously deformed snout. My breathing faltered as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. It lunged at me, those gruesome teeth aiming for my throat. Thankfully, instinct kicked in, and the creature's gnash narrowly missed me as I managed to step aside. Adrenaline coursed through my veins like an electrical storm. What are you? I yelled at the towering beast. But buckle-sized eyes glared back with only hunger and malice as it positioned itself to attack again. Time slowed down for what seemed like an eternity when suddenly a gunshot echoed from the distance. The creature flinched back in pain but continued undeterred. Running inside, I slammed the door shut, desperately searching for ways to barricade myself in the cabin. But the cabin was already being shaken by the roar of that monstrous intruder outside. Heart pounding, sweat dripping off my forehead as I stared at the door separating me from my attacker. The smell of iron permeated through my nostrils. How much blood had smeared into its grotesque fur during past victims. Suddenly there was a knock at the window. It was Marion Wellington, one of those rare neighbors that occasionally hunted by. She anxiously gestured toward her vehicle parked nearby and motioned for me to act quickly. Opening up the door just enough for me to slip through prepping myself mentally for whatever madness awaited another gunshot rang in painful proximity. Run! Marianne shouted. I'll cover you! The creature lunged toward me again. I sprinted toward Marianne's vehicle, heart pounding. She fired more shots, trying to hold the creature back. The beast snarled in pain but kept advancing. Reaching the vehicle, I scrambled inside. Marianne jumped into the driver's seat and slammed on the accelerator. We sped away, leaving the enraged creature behind. What was that thing? I asked between gasps for air. No idea, Marianne replied grimly, gripping the steering wheel. I've never seen anything like it before. We reached her house, a small but sturdy log cabin. A makeshift armory filled with hunting weapons lined one of the walls. Marianne got out her phone and dialed the police. It was our only option for help at this point. She tersely explained our situation and the dispatcher promised that officers would be dispatched to investigate as soon as possible. But Marianne and I both knew we couldn't rely on anyone else to save us from this nightmare. After ending the call, we double-checked the cabin's locks and barricades. While Marianne consulted her hunting books for any information about our monstrous pursuer, I grabbed a shotgun from her collection. What should we do now? I asked, holding my newfound weapon tightly. We'll wait for the police and keep alert. If that thing comes back, we'll be ready to fight, she said with determination. As hours crawled by, our fear hung heavy in the air, but there was no sign of the creature outside. Eventually, we heard sirens approaching. Relief washed over us as several police cars pulled up to the house. Officers took down our statements and searched the area around my cabin. They found evidence of struggle and suggested it might have been a bear attack gone awry, but they couldn't explain its monstrous appearance or relentless aggression toward us. Injured and exhausted, I let out a deep breath. We might have escaped this time, but I knew our lives would never be the same again. Thank you, Marianne, I told her sincerely. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for you. She nodded solemnly, before guiding the police officers out of her home. I went back inside, grateful to have someone on my side in this horrifying ordeal. Days later, Marianne came to visit me at my cabin while I was still recovering from the incident. She had been busy researching what that creature might have been and had a theory. I don't know for sure, but it could be a rogue predator, something that shouldn't exist. 
It might have been mutated or genetically engineered in some underground lab. The closest match is a bear, but bears don't hunt like that, and they certainly don't look like what we saw. Her words offered little comfort. I now lived in constant fear of the day when that beast would return. Marianne declared that she would keep searching for more information about this unknown predator, and maybe even hunt it down so no one else would have to suffer like we did. We tried our best to return to our normal routines, but we both knew how foolish that was. Each day we left our homes, we were at risk of encountering that abomination again. As weeks turned into months, we did our best to move on from the horror of those events, but we never forgot the sound of that creature's thunderous roars nor the sight of its gruesome teeth bared in hungry rage. Though our ordeal was over for now, the dark shadow it cast on our lives hung over us like a heavy burden. We knew this wasn't over, not by a long shot. In memory of those who fell victim to the beast's bloodlust before us, Marianne and I vowed to continue hunting down whatever it was that attacked us. Our search for answers and our quest for revenge had only just begun. And if, or when, that monster decided to resurface once more, we'd be ready to face it, guns blazing. I was looking forward to a peaceful weekend at the cabin, far away from the noise of the city. As I unloaded my groceries from the car, my neighbor, Ennis Weatherby, greeted me with a wave. Hey there, Caleb! Up for a bit of relaxation? Yeah, just needed a break from work, I replied, feeling a sense of freedom already settling in. We chatted for a moment about life and our shared love for escaping to these woods before he returned to his own cabin. Entering the cabin brought back fond memories of childhood with my family, and summers spent exploring the area. I cooked myself dinner before sitting on the porch to enjoy the sunset casting golden rays of light through the dense forest. The distinct aroma of pine filled my senses as evening approached. I had been engrossed in a book when I heard something that sounded like faint screams echoing through the woods. Curious, I walked towards the sound until I reached a clearing where I found Ennis lying on the ground, blood covering his hands. His wide-eyed expression shook me to my core as he mumbled, You need to booby-trap your place. It's coming for us, every generation. And then he lost consciousness. Alarmed but unsure of what he muttered about, I carried him back to his cabin and locked him inside. In any other circumstances, I would have called for help but cell service was non-existent out here. Despite my fear, I knew that improvising some security measures might buy us time against whatever threat loomed. Next morning, while gathering materials for barricading both cabins, I spotted an ominous trail of blood leading away from where I'd found Ennis. Gripping my knife tightly, I decided to follow it. As I ventured further into the woods, the scent of decay assaulted my nostrils more intensely with each step. Suddenly, a rustle in the bushes sent a jolt of adrenaline through my body, and I turned to see a massive creature with razor-sharp claws and patches of matted fur. Its elongated snout, filled with crooked teeth, contorted into a sinister grin as its eyes locked onto mine. Panic seized me, and I sprinted back towards the cabins, determined to warn Ennis and fortify our defenses. Along the way, thoughts raced through my head. What was that creature? How could something like that even exist? When I reached Ennis's cabin, I frantically knocked on the door. He finally answered, his eyes reflecting terror upon hearing my story. As we fortified windows and barricaded doors, I mentioned setting up some bear traps around our properties. Throughout the process of setting up these defenses, 
Ennis told me about his grandfather who died under mysterious circumstances in these woods. The tales varied, but they all whispered about a creature that preyed upon those who wandered too far from safety. Nightfall brought no comfort as we took turns keeping watch from inside the cabin. We could only hope that our preparations would be enough to deter the beast. In a bizarre turn of events, we found dark humor in the situation as Ennis cracked a joke about how unfit it made us feel for staying in the city all these years. The hours dragged on with a suffocating tension hanging over us as we questioned every sound outside. Leaves crunching underfoot or branches snapping echoed like deafening explosions in our ears. As the night grew darker, we settled into an uneasy silence. Suddenly, a loud crash came from just outside the cabin. Ennis and I froze, gripping our makeshift weapons a hammer and a kitchen knife. We heard footsteps circling the cabin, and I tried to muster up the courage to call for help. But all I could do was whisper, Ennis, we should call someone. I managed to choke out. What good would that do? By the time they get here, it might be too late, he said with resignation. Our fear paralyzed us, and we succumbed to our helpless situation. We just listened as the creature outside dragged something heavy across the ground, accompanied by a wet, ripping sound. When daylight finally arrived, we hesitantly stepped outside to see what had transpired during those horrifying hours. We found claw marks etched across the outside walls of our cabins, but worse than that were the corpses of animals littering our property. It looked like a massacre had taken place. Among the carnage was an older man's body. Sneaking out from under the cover of his bedsheet revealed his mutilated face. It was Ennis's neighbor who lived close by. The recognition sent Ennis reeling back in shock and vomiting onto the ground. Despite feeling like my stomach turned to ice upon seeing that grotesque sight, I pulled myself together and dialed 911 on my phone. As expected, when the police arrived after what felt like an eternity, they were skeptical of our recount of last night's horrifying events. All they could do was remove the bodies and tell us an investigation would be conducted. Ennis grabbed me by the arm once they left. We can't stay here, he insisted. Let's just pack our belongings and leave. I nodded as we went back into our cabins to gather our things. As we worked quickly, we made plans to leave and never return to this place again. If its intention was to drive us away then this vile creature had succeeded. With our vehicles loaded, one last glance around the property revealed something else, something we hadn't initially noticed. Hidden among the trees was a small wooden box, carved with intricate patterns, stained with dried blood. I decided to take it with me as we drove away. Maybe someone else could try to understand what had tormented us during our time there and perhaps find a way to stop it. As we left the forest behind us with no desire to ever return, Ennis expressed gratitude for the fact that we hadn't become victims like his unfortunate neighbor. I offered a cold smile in response but couldn't help feeling that we were just lucky. Lucky and forever scarred. But four days later, luck abandoned me as well. While examining the contents of the box in the remote, yet safe cabin where we sought temporary refuge, I inadvertently knocked over a glass containing an unknown liquid. The fumes quickly consumed me before darkness settled in once more. As my vision blurred, I saw glimpses of the monstrous creature standing over me, and memories of that grotesque scene flashed before my eyes. Realization struck. This nightmare would not end simply by running from it. Desperation filled me as I felt those razor-sharp teeth closing in on my flesh, and I could only hope Ennis would have enough time to escape the wrath of the creature that haunted those woods. For myself? I didn't even have time to scream before everything went black.
It was a sunny day when I, Frederick Jansen, arrived at the secluded cabin in the dense woods of Oregon. I had just ended a messy divorce and needed peace to heal my wounds. The magnificent cabin was surrounded by tall trees, creating a serene atmosphere. I even noticed a sparkling creek nearby. As dusk approached, I settled in and lit the fireplace. It crackled softly, dispelling the creeping darkness. Something about the flickering flames prompted me to share stories with my good friend, George Benson. George, do you remember that time we almost got arrested for accidentally setting off fireworks near the police station? We laughed heartily recalling our youthful mischief. Later that night, while rummaging through some old documents left by the previous owner, I discovered an article about gruesome murders nearby. A creature with razor-sharp claws and teeth was described as the perpetrator but never caught. The details were horrific. Soon after reading the article, there was a knock on the door. Opening it hesitantly, I saw my neighbors— Gilbert Kramer and Rosalind Stone, standing outside. They had an anxious look on their faces and explained that some livestock went missing recently. Caution gripped us while discussing these incidents. It didn't occur to us to call for help. We never considered that whatever committed those murders could still be around. We decided to remain vigilant but thought better than to say anything about what we knew. The next day seemed normal at first, birds chirping outside and sunlight filtering through the trees. Walking around outside to explore my new surroundings with an unshakable curiosity despite yesterday's chilling revelations. While wandering deeper into the woods, I discovered something ghastly. Human remains hidden under a thin layer of leaves. I notified my neighbors immediately. Together, we found more evidence of unthinkable carnage, bones stripped clean of flesh and splintered by brute force scattered throughout the woods. Panic settled in, and we questioned our safety. We agreed to stick together, watch each other's backs, and stay armed in case anything dangerous showed up. The first night of group patrol was tense. We toiled to stay vigilant, but the dark woods played tricks on our minds. Shadows were suspicious forms, and every rustle sounded like a predator approaching. Around midnight, when my turn at watch came up, I spotted something eerie through the trees, a humanoid creature with blazing red eyes and grotesque teeth that glinted under the moonlight. It moved unnaturally fast on its elongated limbs. Without thinking, I raised my rifle towards it. Stalking by, it suddenly stopped, staring directly at me. Gilbert! I shouted nervously as adrenaline surged through my veins. My fingers steadied, aimed at the creature before us. They burst from the cabin, their expressions a mix of fear and disbelief. Fire! George yelled in panic as Rosalind watched in horror. The creature charged hastily closer every second. Bullets pierced its body but seemed to have no effect. It did not slow down nor retreat back to the darkness. The creature's grotesque teeth sank into George's shoulder, ripping away flesh and muscle as he screamed in pain. Rosalind dropped to her knees near the fallen comrade, tears flowing freely as she desperately tried to help him. But she was in danger too, the piercing red eyes shifted from George's lifeless form to her, narrowing menacingly. Remembering the rifle still in our hands, my brain snapped into action. Rosalind, move! I yelled. She scrambled back just as I fired another shot at the creature. It came for me next. Despite my initial protective instincts, I couldn't stand my ground against this beast. Instead, my legs surged into motion as I sprinted back towards our cabin. The others followed without hesitation. Our once safe haven now felt anything but secure as we slammed the door shut, our breaths heavy with fear and anxiety. Robert! Call for help! 
I shouted, trying to steady my voice. Robert seized the phone from the kitchen counter, pushing frantically on numbers. There's no signal. We're cut off. His wide-eyed expression showed the terrifying reality of it all. We were trapped. Locked inside with no means of calling for help or escape routes available, we hatched a plan to get out of this dire situation in one piece. Robert would create a diversion with some leftover fireworks from our last cookout, while Gilbert, armed and ready to face the creature again if necessary, would drive us all towards town in his beat-up truck so that we might raise the alarm. As the plan unfolded with surprising coordination and commitment despite our fear, the creature appeared once more in front of the illuminated bursts of light from our makeshift explosion. Its rage-filled face fixated on us as Robert re-entered the vehicle swiftly. We slammed on the accelerator. A high-speed chase commenced through the dark forest. With raging fury in its glowing red eyes, the creature seemed to glide effortlessly through trees and over rocks. Its elongated limbs blurred as it lunged at us with an alarming speed. Gilbert swerved left and right, trying to maintain control and distance on the rugged terrain. But then, fortune finally favored us. A passing truck equipped with several floodlights illuminated our path ahead, momentarily blinding the creature until it hesitated in its pursuit. Seeing our chance, Gilbert sped up, pushing the engine to its limits as we finally broke free from the creature's grasp. Reaching town an hour later, barely believing our luck, we quickly darted into the local police station. We recounted the harrowing tale of torment, omitting no grisly detail as each officer listened in stunned silence. Hours passed, turning into days as they investigated the woods around our cabin. They discovered bones of various animal species and odd tracks leading deeper into the forest, but nothing that directly correlated to our attack or revealed anything more concerning the enigmatic creature we faced. Exhausted and traumatized, we gathered together again after the police closed the case as unsolved, citing a lack of concrete evidence. We mourned George's loss as his brave memory lived on amongst us. The cabin now stood empty and abandoned, a chilling reminder of encounters that are better left untold. We were left with little closure and held an unsettled fear within us. It was clear the creature remained, lurking on the cusp of our nightmares, until perhaps one day lashing out on someone else who may not be so fortunate in their escape. Perhaps it had always been there, or maybe its existence had only recently been awakened by mankind's ever-growing intrusion into nature's shadowy realms. Regardless of its origin, one thing was certain. A monster lurked within those woods that no one knew how to explain or confront. And so we lived alongside this unresolved terror, looking over our shoulders and whispering truths too petrifying to share publicly. Unsure of when, or if ever, such a grotesque nightmare would come to an end. I woke up in the early hours, my head pounding from last night's festivities, a farewell party with my closest friends. My name is Ezra Whitlock. I had recently gone through a rough divorce and needed some time to clear my mind. That's why I decided to spend a couple of weeks in a cabin, deep in the woods of Oregon. The cabin was remote, miles away from any towns or cities, but it was perfect for what I needed. The dense woods surrounded it, creating an eerie silence that helped me to focus on my thoughts. I had been staying here for three days when something unusual caught my attention, clothes scattered on the ground near the cabin. By nature, I was skeptical, but my curiosity got the best of me. As I examined the scene further, I discovered something gruesome, a severed hand, partially covered by leaves and dirt. A wave of panic washed over me, 
But before I could make any decisions, a man stumbled out of the trees, bloodied and disoriented. His name was Florian Adler, a hiker who had lost his way during his solo trip. I invited him into the cabin to assess his wounds. He explained that he had been attacked by an unidentified creature while exploring the woods alone. It hunted him relentlessly before he narrowly escaped. Geraldine Knapp, our neighbor who lived half a mile away, came by to see if we needed help when she heard our panicked voices. She chimed in about rumors that circulated among locals, whispers of an elusive creature lurking within these woods. The stories varied from generation to generation, but they all agreed on one thing. Whatever it was, it was relentless, brutal, and very real. Despite our fears and apprehension, we knew we had no choice but to venture back out together in search of help or escape from this wooded trap. We armed ourselves as best as we could with what few items were available in the cabin. A hatchet, a hunting knife, and even an old rifle that I found stashed away. As our motley crew trekked cautiously through the dense Oregon forest, we came across more evidence of the monster's brutality. Shallow graves, makeshift traps, and remnants of what looked like a makeshift prison. Anxiety tightened its grip on our hearts. Beyond our silent reservation, we shared stories about our lives. Ezra the lawyer seeking solace after a crushing divorce, Florian the adventurous hiker who longed to escape mundane city life, and Geraldine the wise woman acquainted with local folklore. We were hopeful that sharing would bring comfort. Just as dusk fell, we encountered the creature for the first time. It stood before us, tall and hulking with matted fur matted that barely concealed powerful muscles beneath. Its eyes glinted red in the dying light. Saliva dripped from its cavernous jaws veined with fresh blood. In our fear-stricken state, we haphazardly fired off a few rounds from the rifle and swung our weapons aimlessly. To our collective surprise, the creature retreated momentarily into the thicket. The taste of victory was bittersweet, however. Geraldine had been severely injured during our scuffle with the creature, her arm torn clean from her body. Desperately I tried to tend to Geraldine's wound as Florian kept watch, his eyes darting through every inch of encroaching darkness surrounding us. Meanwhile, Geraldine tried her best to create makeshift crutches from nearby branches so she could continue on this horrific journey. There wasn't any time to mourn or recover. We were in an all-out battle for survival. The air turned frigid as night settled in. Paranoia became our only companion. In whispers barely audible above wind-blown leaves, we spoke of rescue plans and an uncertain future. Suddenly, the ground shook, splintered tree trunks cracked, and a guttural roar echoed in the night's cold embrace. The creature had returned, more furious than ever. Intense fear pulsed through our veins as we prepared, one last time, to face our unknown adversary head-on. We glanced at each other, panic-stricken. We knew that our only chance of survival was to put as much distance between us and the creature as possible. So we hobbled forward, Geraldine leaning on her makeshift crutches and wincing with every step while Florian and I kept a watchful eye on our pursuer. Every rustle in the trees sent us jumping in terror, unsure of whether it was the wind playing tricks on us or the harbinger of our impending doom. Why didn't we call for help? Florian muttered under his breath. We could have had backup. Phones have been dead since we entered this forest, I replied, my voice barely audible. As we crossed a small clearing, I spotted a cabin in the distance. There, I whispered to Geraldine and Florian. It might provide some protection. The night wore on as we hobbled toward the cabin. Upon reaching it, we burst through the door and quickly barricaded ourselves inside. The antagonists who stalked us didn't take long to come into view. 
In horror, we watched as it circled around the cabin its monstrous form barely illuminated by the scant moonlight. It emitted a guttural snarl that reverberated through the rickety structure. While Geraldine continued to fight against her own pain so that she could make sense of this ordeal logically. The creature eventually stopped and stared straight through a crack in the cabin wall, its eyes locked onto mine. For a horrifying moment, I felt like it would lunge at me right then and there, only to back away suddenly. We desperately needed an exit strategy before this creature came at us again. The injured among us were Geraldine but also Florian, who was suffering psychologically from being stalked relentlessly by this beast without knowing anything about it. To him, there was no guarantee he would survive another encounter with the monster. Suddenly, we found ourselves powerless. The cabin door shuddered under a series of vicious blows. The creature had begun its attack anew infuriated by our meager attempt to escape its clutches. In a split second, the cabin door crumbled under the brute force of the creature's onslaught. It entered, hatred blazing in its eyes. It swiped at Florian, who lay on the floor, knocked unconscious by the impact of the shattered door. Frantically, I began to pull at Geraldine in an attempt to drag her away from the corner of the cabin in which she was slumped. But to no avail my own fatigue had grown too great after days of running and avoidance. Geraldine's eyes widened in terror as the creature loomed over her fragile form. But then something changed her expression morphed into one of quiet determination. With a surge of strength neither of us thought she still possessed, Geraldine thrust her makeshift crutch sharply into one of the creature's eyes with unbelievable precision. It screamed in pain and stumbled back momentarily, blinded by Geraldine's attack. She took this opportunity to collapse onto its back and locked her legs around its neck, choking it with all her remaining strength. The creature writhed and thrashed as it tried to dislodge Geraldine from atop it but she held on steadfastly her face a mask of pure resolve. Eventually, it let out an agonized gasp for breath before ultimately collapsing to the ground. Geraldine released her grip and slid off of it. Both she and the creature lay motionless side by side on the cabin floor. As I tried to make sense of what happened and contemplated how we would ever make it out of this nightmarish situation alive, I knew that we would be forever grateful for Geraldine's courage in facing our seemingly insurmountable foe head-on, and that we would never forget her valiant, if ruthless, actions. I remember the day I decided to escape from my mundane city life retreating into the isolated woods of Serenity Falls, so named for their quiet beauty. My name is Jarvis Thompson, recently divorced and seeking solace from the chaos of working as a private investigator back in the city. I needed a change, a new beginning away from it all. As I entered the cabin, soft yet fatigued creaks resonated from the wooden floor. The space felt familiar, like a loving embrace from nature itself. It was an old hunting cabin, with antlers mounted on the walls and well-worn furniture providing comfort. In my first few days, I met the few reclusive neighbors who lived around that area, including an elderly couple who brought me a humble homemade pie such as Mr. Orson Whitlock and his wife Miriam. Conversations were liberally peppered with jokes that never failed to make me chuckle. It took a few nights for me to grow accustomed to the eerie silence, broken only by nocturnal animals going about their business. However, as time passed, I began noticing unusual events happening in my new home. Peculiar noises penetrated the stillness outside my cabin near midnight while I sat reading one night. It sounded like rustling in the bushes followed by faint footsteps that grew louder before retreating again within seconds. I cautiously opened the door, but found nothing disturbing my peace. 
disturbed over a series of missing persons reports in the vicinity over several weeks, I decided to investigate these unusual occurrences myself, skeptical that something sinister was lurking in these peaceful woods. On one moonlit night while exploring deeper into the forest, strange scratches marked trees repeatedly caught my attention. They appeared distinctive yet patterned as if deliberately left by some skilled hunter. Thoughts raced through my head who or what could have made them. Further among twisted roots and branches obstructing my way, a hideous figure skulked off some distance away. Its posture unnaturally bent, agile like a predatory animal. The briefest glimpse of its face revealed sharp features set against an indistinguishable visage corrupted with violence. Uneasy by the creature's every move, I decided to remain hidden, fearing it might perceive me as its next victim. Unable to call for help considering the remoteness of my location, no neighbors could hear me even if I screamed. As my heart rate spiked uncontrollably, Mr. Orson's distinctive laugh echoed from somewhere nearby. I prayed hope that the elderly man wasn't in danger. Unbeknownst to me, the vile thing heard his laughter too and turned its attention towards Orson's voice. As it hungrily stalked him, my adrenaline kicked in. I knew I had to intervene before the terrifying creature seized an innocent life. In a swift, calculated move, I pounced out from behind a tree and tackled the thing with all my strength. During our ensuing struggle on the muddy ground beneath our bodies, a predatory growl escaped its throat, raising goosebumps along my arms. Momentarily distracted by my appearance and actions, the creature momentarily loosened its grip on me. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, I tried using any available means within reach. Rocks, sticks, anything to at least incapacitate it enough to escape. Orson courageously joined me in combating this monster, his old age not deterring him from fighting back against the threat that now occupied our lives. Together we pushed past fear and limits as we fought an overpowering adversary either of us ever anticipated confronting in these tranquil forests dirt and blood mixed together on our skin as we noticed layers of scars lining this thing's body, evidence of previous fights it had survived. Our combined efforts seemed futile against its seemingly endless energy reserves and aggressive demeanor. Sweat dripped from our brows as we reluctantly realized the impending possibility of the creature overpowering us. Orson and I continued battling the creature our movements becoming increasingly desperate. We knew we couldn't keep this up indefinitely. Harsh breathing filled the air as our bodies screamed in exhaustion and pain from sustaining various injuries. Noticing a momentary lapse in the creature's focus, I shouted to Orson to run for help. It was a gamble, but at this point, we were running out of options. Go, Orson! Find help! I'll try to hold it off. He hesitated for a moment, torn between his loyalty to me and his desire to survive. Finally, with a determined nod, Orson sprinted away as fast as his old legs could carry him. I knew there was little chance of rescue arriving in time. Still, I had to try and buy Orson time to hopefully find someone who could help us against this seemingly unstoppable foe. With its target now gone, the creature growled in frustration and lunged at me again. The nauseating smell of blood and sweat permeated through the air as we continued grappling with each other. A faint murmur of voices reached my ears as I fought on with all my remaining strength. The sounds grew louder until they became unmistakable. Orson had returned with help. As relief washed over me, I noticed several people brandishing makeshift weapons rushing towards us. Unprepared for this new development, the creature backtracked slightly, its eyes darting back and forth between me and the group of people rushing closer. It wasn't long before some of them managed to land a few solid hits on the creature's body, 
causing it to double over in pain. This combined effort finally provided the opportunity needed to subdue it temporarily. With its body now heavily weakened by multiple injuries, we quickly bound it with chains and heavy ropes to prevent it from resuming its vicious assault. Although everyone was still wary of it breaking free, we could see the creature struggling, its energy dwindling. In the aftermath of this brutal battle, I became intensely curious about what kind of creature we had just faced. Questions raced through my mind. What was it? Where had it come from? Nothing about this thing seemed familiar to me or any of my acquaintances. The creature itself appeared to be a cross between an enormous wolf and a bear, with sharp teeth and enormous claws that seemed almost unnatural in their size and sharpness. Its unusually thick coat bore the weight of numerous battle scars acquired over what must have been an incredibly violent existence. I realized that despite our best efforts, our chances of keeping this monster restrained were fading with every minute that passed. We had to figure out what it was and how to contain it before it could regain its strength and terrorize us all over again. News of the strange creature spread rapidly throughout the area, drawing experts from various fields to our quiet forest community. Sadly, none of them could confidently identify the species or provide any viable solutions for how to deal with it. Yet, even after weeks had passed since we had first discovered the creature in our midst, its captors managed to maintain their tenuous control over it. The collective fear within our community began to dissipate as the relief of having, at least temporarily, survived such a horrific experience began to take hold. Lives were lost, deep cuts in our close-knit community that would take a long time to heal. The gruesome ordeal we all face taught us many lessons. It taught us the importance of unity against adversity and inner strength shared across generations. Through these difficult times, we learn more about ourselves and each other than ever before. The terrifying yet mysterious creature remained captive for now, as a constant reminder that sometimes not all threats could be readily understood or easily contained. And so, we lived on tentatively in its ominous presence, aware that the dread it had once instilled in us could return any time. But for now, we had our lives back and that was enough. We were survivors. I've always enjoyed the solitude of living alone in my cabin, nestled within Blackwood Forest. My name is Yellow Alvarado, and I moved here from a busy city to escape the constant noise. Despite the quiet life, I did find myself missing human interaction from time to time, so I invited my sister Tempe and our friend Bryant Leclerc to stay with me for a weekend getaway. On our first day, we took a hike and admired the beautiful surroundings. We laughed at each other's jokes and shared stories about our lives since we last met. While we were walking, we stumbled upon an old wooden structure seemingly abandoned among the trees. Not thinking much of it, we continued trekking through the forest. As night approached, our little group returned to my cabin. We gathered around the fireplace, enjoying a home-cooked meal as darkness settled across the woods. While Tempe entertained us with her stories about her office antics, I couldn't help but feel uneasy after recalling that mysterious old building in the woods. When morning came, everything seemed normal until we discovered that Tempe had not woken up yet. After waiting some more time and receiving no response from behind her closed door, we became increasingly worried. As I opened her door with Bryant by my side, we stood horrified at what we saw. Tempe's bed was covered in blood with scratches and cuts all over her pale body. Unable to imagine who or what could have done this, panic started brewing in my chest. Looking out the window, there was no one in sight, no neighbors to call for help. 
Upon realizing that our cell phones were dead from lack of signal and charging since morning landed us on edge even more. We decided to examine the area around the cabin for any clues concerning Tempe's attacker. As we cautiously moved through the woods together, feeling continuously anxious over our discovery of dried blood on leaves, we noticed the structure we passed on our hike the day before. Heart pounding in my chest, I nudged Bryant, and we approached the grimy old wooden building. Hesitantly opening the door, we were immediately overwhelmed with a sickly scent that sent chills down my spine. To our horror, inside were stacks of bones and torn clothes scattered around the dirt floor. Retreating from the scene, we concluded that this must be connected to Tempe's death. We knew we should call authorities but were cut off from communication. Our only option was to walk miles back toward town to seek help. Before starting our trek towards town, we gathered what we might need for protection, a hunting knife from the cabin and a tree branch as crude weaponry. Fear gripped us like a vice as we moved as quickly as possible through the woods with tears reflecting our terror. Suddenly, we caught sight of a grotesque creature emerging from behind a tree. It was terrifyingly large with twisted limbs and elongated claws dripping with a dark red substance. Its murky eyes revealed nothing but malice. This revolting creature was unmistakably responsible for both Tempe's death and the grisly scene at the hidden structure. Running away seemed impossible. Regardless of how fast and far we tried to travel, it always seemed to draw near relentlessly. In one last-ditch effort to escape its grasp, Bryant lunged forward with his branch bludgeoning the horrible monster's face. Brian's branch connected with the creature's face with a sickening thud, a sound that haunts me to this day. The creature let out a guttural moan, momentarily retreating into the woods. We knew then that running and hiding would only postpone a gruesome fate. Desperate and out of options, we decided it was time to call for help. We whipped out our phones but realized we had no signal in these remote woods. Our panic turned into hope as we remembered the nearby ranger station. If we could reach someone, perhaps they could get help or at least warn others about the terror lurking here. As we sprinted towards the ranger station, we constantly glanced behind us, fearing that the creature could emerge from the shadows at any moment. The twisted limbs of trees seemed like extensions of the monster itself, reaching out to ensnare us. Finally reaching the ranger station, we pounded on the door, begging someone to answer. Relief washed over us as Ranger Wilson opened it, his confused expression quickly changing to concern when he saw our disheveled and frightened appearances. We quickly explained what had happened, omitting no gruesome detail and pleaded for his help. Ranger Wilson immediately sprang into action, guiding us inside while using his radio to call in reinforcements from nearby towns. As we waited anxiously inside the station, I couldn't help but think about Tempe, hoping their sacrifice wouldn't be in vain. Hours later, search parties and local police arrived at our location. With medical professionals attending to Bryant and me, Patching up any injuries obtained during our escape, we were finally able to take a breath and process everything that had happened. Days went by as news spread of an investigation surrounding Tempe's death and the possible existence of a hostile creature in our midst. The town buzzed with theories about its origin. Though I knew nothing of folklore or legends, I couldn't help but wonder what the creature truly was. Had it arrived recently, or had it always lurked here, watching us from the shadows? Despite the best efforts of authorities and search parties, no trace of the monster could be found, only further heightening tensions and fears in the area. As for me, I couldn't shake the image of that heinous being. Our encounter haunted my dreams. Finally, in a stunning development that would rock our small community to its core, 
a local trapper discovered the creature's den deep within a cave system. Cave drawings revealed the beast's existence had spanned centuries, preying on unsuspecting victims throughout history as they ventured too deep into its territory. Trappers managed to capture and kill the creature. Though gruesome as it were, it brought closure to our nightmare. As life began returning to normal, or as normal as it could be after such an ordeal, we held a service for Tempe and mourned their loss together. The chilling memory of that creature remains seared into my mind. I find solace in knowing that, although we lost a dear friend and faced unimaginable horrors, we stopped others from suffering a similar fate. The days grew brighter as the town began healing from its collective trauma. We supported each other through processing all we had seen and experienced. And while I can never forget that fateful day or the evil we encountered, I also hold on firmly to the strength and unity it instilled within us all. We were no longer just friends or strangers. We were survivors who had braved darkness beyond comprehension and emerged stronger together. My name is Bartholomew Jeffries, and I've always been an avid outdoors enthusiast. After another mundane week in the office, I decided to take a break and spend some time at my cabin in West Virginia's Monongahela National Forest, my home away from home. The cabin was nestled deep in the woods, a picture-perfect scene of natural beauty. Tall trees whispered gently as a fragrant wind danced through their branches while squirrels chased one another playfully. Nature never failed to bring peace to my soul. The first few days were pure bliss, hiking by day and reading by the firelight by night. It wasn't until Wednesday that I noticed something was off. On my morning hike, I came across a mutilated deer, unlike anything I had seen before. It wasn't just dead, it was torn apart, limbs strewn haphazardly across the clearing. Disturbing and disgusting indeed. What could have done that? I thought aloud, as goosebumps involuntarily crawled up my spine. Knowing that it could have been a predator's doing, I swiftly made my way back to the cabin where rationality returned and I reassured myself it was an unfortunate stroke of nature. That evening, as darkness settled over the verdant landscape, strange noises echoed through the forest, ones I had never heard before. Despite my expert knowledge in wildlife behavior, this unfamiliar sound left me unsettled. The next morning on an abandoned trail, a series of scratch marks caught my eye. Signs of something clawing at trees every few yards signaled that whatever made those sounds last night also left these markings behind. This peculiar happening spurred me to call my brother Norbert Jeffries who lived in a neighboring town. I've come across some odd things up here, I confided. Odd? What do you mean? he asked curiously. Well, I began hesitantly. First that mutilated deer, and now these strange marks on the trees. Bartholomew, listen. I've heard stories of a creature that roams these woods, Norbert said gravely. We don't talk about it much around here, but folks have been going missing in the past. Just be careful, okay? I scoffed at his assertion, having no room for superstition in my pragmatic nature. But deep down, a part of me wondered if there was some truth to it all. That night, strange rustlings invaded my dreams something hunting in the darkness. As I awoke abruptly, I knew the noise was not part of my slumber anymore. It was real and right outside my cabin. Grabbing a heavy-duty flashlight and my trusty shotgun, I crept out into the night. What I saw in the beam of light could not have been a figment of my imagination. A monstrous creature loomed before me, impossibly tall with mottled skin and damp fur clinging to its jagged frame. Its eyes glinted with brutal coldness 
and hunger as it bore down upon me. Paralyzed with fear yet determined not to succumb easily, I steeled myself for an encounter that would either claim my life or grant me one hell of a story to tell. My finger trembled on the trigger as it slowly approached. Stay back! I shouted in defiance, trying to convince myself as much as the beast. Then, unexpectedly, it stopped advancing. Why are you here? It uttered with an unearthly growl that seemed impossible from such an entity. What? What do you want? I managed to stammer out, fear causing my voice to break as my grip tightened around the shotgun. It looked at me hungrily for a moment before answering. You will find out soon enough. Suddenly, without warning, it lunged at me, its powerful arms ready to engulf me whole. Panicked, my finger found its mark and the shotgun roared to life, piercing the night. The impact of the shotgun blast sent the creature reeling backward, giving me some reprieve. My heart was pounding as I thought of my next move. If I called for help, who would believe me? Even if they did, would anyone even know what to do when faced with such a creature? As the creature recovered from the shot, it faced me again. It had suffered damage, but was still standing, clearly not a regular animal. I aimed once more and fired again, this time hitting it squarely in the chest. It fell to the ground with a thud but was still alive. I ran back towards my cabin and locked the door. Calling for help wasn't an option. People would label me crazy. The creature continued to scratch and claw at the door, its vicious snarls sending tremors through my body. Dawning realization forced me to consider that this animal might have already killed others in its path. It was unlike any bear or mountain lion I had ever seen perhaps a new species that science hadn't discovered yet. A plan slowly formed in my mind. I needed to escape while keeping the creature occupied so it wouldn't follow me. I searched my cabin for anything that could make noise or distract it. Pots and pans seemed like my best bet. I opened my cabin window and hurled pots and pans in different directions, creating loud, clanging noises that echoed through the night. As I had hoped, the creature's attention shifted from trying to break down my door to investigating the unexpected cacophony. Taking advantage of this distraction, I darted through my back door and into the dense trees surrounding my home. Sweat poured down my face as I crashed through tangled branches, all while trying to keep silent in avoiding detection. As I moved further away from the cabin, I took note of where I was going to avoid getting lost in panic. Each step took considerable effort, but I knew that this was my best chance at survival. The creature would certainly catch up to me if I got lost or disoriented. Soon enough, it was clear that my plan had worked my improvised noise diversion had thrown the creature off my trail. It was still close, but no longer hot on my heels. This opportunity allowed me to move faster, getting as much distance between us as possible. As dawn began to break, my body begged for rest. But I knew better than to stop now. The creature could be nearby, waiting for a moment of weakness. The adrenaline kept me vigilant there was no way I would survive another encounter with it. Tired and desperate, I stumbled upon a small road that cut through the woods. A sigh of relief filled me with renewed hope as I realized that civilization was within reach. Keeping one eye on the tree line and one eye on the road, I cautiously made my way down until I saw an approaching vehicle. I held my breath and prayed for safety as the car approached me. As it slowed down beside me, I glanced at the driver, a man in his fifties with concerned eyes that met mine. "'What's going on out here?' he asked kindly. I hesitated but knew I had no other choice but to trust him. "'There's a dangerous animal back there,' I managed not wanting to sound insane by providing too much detail. 
The man nodded solemnly, understanding more than he could know about what had transpired over the past hours. He allowed me to clamber into his vehicle and made our way out of those treacherous woods. My ordeal was over for now, though my story would live with me forever. This horrifying experience was a tale I could hardly believe myself, who would imagine such a monstrous creature lurking in the shadows. Till this day, there's partial closure with this haunting memory, as the creature was eventually discovered and acknowledged by science. A new species of predator, one that walked the line between reality and legend. The unfortunate souls who didn't make it out alive remain forever in my thoughts. Forever enshrined in the truth that some horrifying secrets are best left undiscovered. My name's Bartholomew Jensen, and what I'm about to tell you is the kind of tale most people wouldn't believe. A few years back, I decided to take a break from city life and rented a cabin deep in the Deschutes National Forest in Oregon. I expected peace and quiet, but my retreat turned into a nightmarish experience. The cabin was cozy, nestled between towering pines, and boasted a small creek nearby. On my third day there, during an afternoon stroll, I stumbled upon an old pickup truck in the woods. The rust-eaten vehicle had clearly been forgotten for years. Broken glass covered the floor by the driver's side from the shattered window. Curiosity tugged at me, but I shook it off and returned to my cabin. That evening, I met Randall Hayes outside his neighboring cabin, chopping wood. He had an unkempt beard and wore overalls that were well past their prime. We struck up a conversation, mostly about our shared appreciation for escaping city life. After a few shared stories of run-ins with wildlife, Randall mentioned something unsettling. Around these parts, he whispered, tightening his grip on the axe handle, folks say there's something lurking in these woods that ain't quite right. He suggested that it had brought turmoil to many campers who had come before us. Some of them never returned home. At first, I thought he must be joking, maybe trying to spook me since I was new to the area. But as days passed by, peculiar incidents occurred around my cabin. I noticed fresh scratches along my front door every morning, high up on the door frame, too high for any animal to reach. Torn clothing littered the surrounding trees each night, as though they'd been hanging before being ripped down by something with vicious intent. I asked Randall if he'd encountered anything strange himself, but he just shrugged. He said such strange things are not too unusual in the woods, and I should just remain vigilant. One day, while exploring an old hiking trail, I encountered something that changed my perspective entirely. I found a small cave tucked away behind overgrown bushes and blackberry vines. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness within, I spotted a horrifying sight. At first glance, it looked like a pile of bones until I realized they bore the agonizing remnants of people who had gone missing in the area. Each corpse lay in varying degrees of decay, many mutilated beyond recognition. Petrified, I retreated from that gruesome chamber and bolted back to my cabin. Sweating and panting, I informed Randall about the cave. His sunken eyes grew wide with fear as he grabbed his shotgun. We've got to call for help, he suggested. However, there was no phone signal at our remote location. We were entirely cut off from civilization. As daylight dwindled, we prepared for whatever terror might befall us that night. We secured both our cabins as effectively as possible, boarding up windows and barricading doors. Though terrified beyond words, we decided to stick together in Randall's cabin. Hours passed without incident. Too terrified to sleep, 
We sat on edge in grim silence punctuated only by the sound of Randall nervously tapping his fingers on his shotgun. Suddenly, an earth-shaking growl roared from outside followed by quick thuds, like frantic footsteps approaching the door. Unseen claws scraped violently across the wooden exterior with a fury that made our hair stand on end. I caught a glimpse of something monstrous through a crack between two boarded-up windows, an abomination made of thick muscle and hardened sinew that defied all logic, part human, part beast bathed in the moon's unforgiving light. Exhausted and driven by animal instinct after so much fear, I felt a sudden rush of adrenaline. A primal anger flooded through me. Like a firestorm I clenched my fists knowing that I had to act to survive. I whispered our plan to Randall. We have one chance. When it breaks in, we'll use everything we've got to drive it back and run. Clenching his shotgun, Randall nodded nervously as he positioned himself beside the door. All right, Bartholomew. Let's do this. As I held on to my crowbar, Randall cocked the shotgun. The growling intensified, followed by heavy breathing from whatever was outside. We huddled together in a corner, trying to stay as far away from the door as possible. It was then that another sound joined the cacophony, ringing. I realized it was my cell phone that was left untouched since the ordeal began. Randall's eyes met mine in understanding. This was our chance to call for help. I'll keep it at bay, said Randall, eyes focused on the door. You called the police. I dialed 911, breathing a sigh of relief as the operator answered. 911, what's your emergency? There's, there's something out here with us, I whispered urgently. A monster. I don't know what it is, but it's trying to get inside our cabin. The operator responded calmly but with a hint of skepticism. Can you give me your location? I provided our coordinates and begged for them to hurry. The growling continued outside while we waited time had never moved so slowly. Suddenly, the cabin trembled under intense force as the creature started pounding on the front door. Randall shot at it through the barricade once, twice only momentarily delaying its relentless pursuit. The seconds ticked away agonizingly as we mentally willed our rescuers to arrive. Lights appeared in the distance. Relief washed over us. Help had come at last. Through cracks in the barricades, I could see several police officers cautiously approaching our cabin. Stay inside, one shouted. Randall and I held our breaths as they fired at the beast. Gunshots and growls filled the air harmoniously before abruptly ending with an eerie silence. The police removed some of the boards and escorted us out of the cabin into safety. Glimpsing around, there lay an enormous, grotesque creature on the ground. It was an amalgamation of human and animal-like features, with tough, horn skin and a repulsive odor that made my stomach churn. Its large claws still twitched, a final reminder that it was indeed alive not long ago. I overheard one officer mumble. This thing must be a mutant, or some kind of scientific experiment gone wrong. I nodded, unable to offer any more insight. Upon returning to civilization, the events from that night haunted us for months. News articles tried piecing together what had happened, speculations about secret government experiments gone awry or reclusive genius geneticists were rampant. The truth? Only Randall and I knew the depths of our horror. Piecing our lives back together took time, but the thought of never encountering that monster again provided solace. Our rescuers never received a proper thank you burdened by the memory of their bravery in the face of an abomination that few could understand. Nowadays, Randall and I only venture into towns and cities when necessary. We've dedicated ourselves to searching for answers about the true nature of the beast we faced why it existed, and whether others like it roam free. 
The only conclusion we can draw is that humanity has unlocked something far more dangerous than they can comprehend in pushing the boundaries of science, reminding us that some things should remain devoutly untouched. Our story remains largely untold, dismissed as a hoax by many. But we continue our search undeterred hoping to find answers and foster awareness so no one else has to live through what we did that night. And although we escaped with our lives, our hearts ache for those who may not have been as fortunate, victims of unforeseen consequences born from humanity's hubris and endless pursuit of progress. It was supposed to be a much-needed break from the city, a retreat to the quietude of nature. My name is Eamon Dudley, and I'd recently gone through a rather painful divorce. I needed the solace of the woods to clear my head. So, here I was in a small cabin tucked away in the Pocono Mountains, Pennsylvania. The cabin itself was unassuming made of timber with a porch out front. Inside, I found a cozy living room with an old pot-bellied stove in one corner and a kitchen on the other side of the room. One day, while chopping wood outside, I noticed a commotion by the edge of the tree lean. I squinted at a figure hunched over and shuffling toward me Grady Culhane, an odd old man who lived nearby. Grady, what brings you here? He looked rather spooked. Amen, there's something out there, he whispered. What do you mean? I asked skeptically. I heard footsteps outside my cabin last night and went out to investigate. But it wasn't human. I raised an eyebrow with disbelief but didn't laugh. Instead, curiosity got the better of me. What did it look like? I only caught a glimpse before it ran off into the forest. Grady explained breathlessly. But it was enormous. Long limbs and sharp claws. I think we have ourselves a problem on our hands. That night as I lay in bed, I couldn't shake off Grady's words from my head. The image of some creature stalking these woods unsettled me. I decided to give Olga McLuhan, my good friend and wildlife expert in town, a call about this mystery being... Olga arrived at my cabin early next morning to investigate any signs left by the supposed creature. Understanding her reputation for being rational, she had a good head on her shoulders. I trusted her instincts. She could tell if something was even slightly amiss. We set out into the woods, following the path Grady indicated. We stumbled upon tracks unlike any I'd seen before large, clawed footprints etched in the soft earth, stretching far off into the trees. Olga stared at them in deep thought, trying to discern whether any known animals could have left such prints. I've never seen anything like these, she muttered while tracing her fingers along one of the impressions. Whatever it is, it's not native to this area. Each day the same pattern emerged, bold sightings by distressed locals and commotion near our cabins. The quietude I craved seemed like a distant memory now. Grady, Olga, and I convened to discuss this escalating situation. The unanimous decision, we needed to witness this creature ourselves before involving law enforcement, a sort of neighborhood watch. Armed with flashlights and rifles in hand, we patrolled a generous perimeter encompassing our homes, on guard for anything unusual or dangerous that might cross our path. Tonight was moonless, a darkness so complete my chest tightened with anxiety every time a twig snapped underfoot. Hours passed without incident until we heard crashing sounds coming from deeper within the woods. Adrenaline surged through us as we fanned out our training minimal but determination unwavering, ready for our first direct encounter with this terrifying entity. Flashlights swept through bushes and trees with frantic desperation, hearts pounding in our ears when suddenly, there it was. 
tall and monstrous with elongated limbs and gleaming eyes. It lunged for Olga, swiping a sharp claw toward her vulnerable flesh, its intent sinister and deadly. I tightened my grip around the gun butt and locked sights on its gnarled form. In a split second, I pulled the trigger, and the bullet struck the creature in its hairy chest. It howled in pain, staggering back from Olga before it tumbled to the ground. Grady quickly moved to help Olga up, while my eyes never left the fallen beast. We cautiously approached it, rifles still trained on its form in case it recovered. But as we neared the motionless body, we noticed its limbs slowly shrinking, becoming almost human-like. The bridge of its nose flattened, and its mouth receded into a small pair of lips. It was now apparent that this terrifying entity was something that belonged neither to nature nor anything we had seen before somehow an unholy mixture between man and animal. We exchanged nervous glances but said nothing. The sickening crunch of bones rearranging themselves made us shudder instinctively. We knew we were out of our depth here. The creature's grotesque transformation forced us to make a decision quickly. We couldn't handle this ourselves, we needed help. I whipped out my cell phone with trembling hands and dialed 911. As I explained our situation to the operator on the other end of the line, I could hear sirens in the distance growing closer with each passing moment. Local police arrived first, then animal control officers, and finally even people claiming to be government agents. As they all swarmed around us and dealt with the creature, my thoughts kept returning to a question that haunted me. What was it? They took DNA samples from the beast and sealed off the area around our cabins after noting every detail they could extract from us about our bizarre situation. The investigation team spent days combing through the woods searching for clues. One of them spoke up and mentioned a species of animal unknown to us something called a cryptid. But whatever that was, it didn't matter now. These people had taken over and would find answers we couldn't provide. We three neighbors were eventually able to return to our cabins, but the quiet we once knew was replaced with an uneasy hush. Olga, Grady, and I kept a wary vigil over each other's homes, the events of that night forever etching a permanent scar in our memories. As days turned into weeks and months into years, the memory of that fateful encounter faded but never fully disappeared. The creature had been defeated, but its influence remained like a dark cloud over our homes. Olga moved away, unable to shake the sense of lingering dread and the unspoken atrocities inflicted on her by that heinous monster. Grady and I stayed behind, continuing to watch over our small community in defiance of whatever horrors might lurk in the shadows. In the years that followed our dreadful encounter with that beast, I became somewhat obsessed with finding answers about its origin. I learned about cryptozoologists who hunted for unexplained creatures across the globe, but found no definitive proof or identification for what we had encountered. I still patrol our neighborhood at night occasionally, ruminating on those bone-chilling events while armed with a rifle in hand. Though time has worn away certain aspects of that harrowing night, one thing remains true. Whatever that creature was or where it came from is still a mystery waiting to be unraveled. As I continue my watch, never knowing when something else may descend upon us from the darkness of the woods, I pay silent homage to Olga's courage and Grady's loyalty. Together, we stood against an unimaginable terror. Together, we survived and yet forever carry within us the scars left by a monster who rose from some unknown realm seeking only destruction. We may never know its true origin or purpose, but with determination and unyielding vigilance born of fear, we will ensure it never returns.